Um, uh, City Clerk, uh, let me know when we're ready to go, please. We are ready to go. For a second for Mr. Medina. I can hear the water. He's back. Okay. Um, all right. Good. <laughs> That's fine. Perfect timing. All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the San Bernardino City Council meeting of February the 9th, 2020. I'm calling this meeting to order. May I please have roll call? Council Member Hamilton? Here. Council Member Mason? Here. Council Member Salazar? Here. Vice Mayor Marty Medina? Here. And Mayor Rico Medina? Here. Uh, once, if I could uh, ask all of Council, uh, if able to stand, if not, if you would sit and us jointly together uh, lead in the pledge. I. Pledge of Allegiance. I'll join in. Can't hear anybody. To the flag, flag of, of the United, United States, States, States of America, of America. And, and to the Republic, to the Republic for, which for which it stands, stands one nation, one nation under, God, under God, God, indivisible, indivisible with, liberty with liberty and justice, and justice for all. For all. Thank you all, and I know everybody was being good about keeping their mic off. So <laughs> there was no background noise. Sorry about that. Um, thank you. What we are going to do at this time, we will move on to item number three, public comments for items not on the agenda. Individual will be allowed three minutes. It is the council's policy to refer matters raised in this forum to staff for investigation and or action where appropriate. The Brown Act prohibits the council from discussing or acting upon any matter not agendized pursuant to state law. And city clerk, I know we have some folks, and if you would please be so kind to take over and bring them in. Yes, first we have Bo Smith. Just one moment while I bring you in. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, whenever you're ready. Great. Thank you. I just wanted to come tonight and report on the overpasses going through San Bruno and the that Caltrans has not taken any action at this point to clean them up. Um, I went out and saw them today. They're the overpasses at, you know, the 280 and the 380 at El Camino and the 101, but the one I went and visited today was the 280 at El Camino. And um, I'd just like to encourage the city to, you know, I pursue you know, negotiations with Caltrans, I guess we've been trying to do that for years. I really think we should sue them. Um, and if we don't sue them, like uh, Councilwoman uh, Mason suggested last week of a maintenance contract that evidently nobody on the peninsula has a maintenance contract, with, that we be the first, that they pay us money to take care of cleaning up these on ramps and off ramps. They're absolutely atrocious. Um, it's sad, you know, it's really, really sad. Um, you know, how we communicate with each other as, you know, citizens to the council and the city um, matters. And it just seems that the voice of the people that want to, you know, not live in this squalor are not being heard. That we speak and we ask for action and nothing happens. And it creates such a sense of apathy and hopelessness. And, um, you know, to be sort of To be okay with this litter and just drive by it like it's, you know, just part of daily living is really a sad state of affairs for us. And I don't think we realize the, the impact it has on us as a society. Um, you know, that we're, our children are seeing this where it's, you know, it's just going to be like a normal thing to have litter strewn around all the time. It's just not good for us. 
and um, I'm willing to do whatever I can do to help the city and carry forward, you know, doing some action taking on these state properties. So um, my time's coming to a close and um, I really hope you do something. I, I really hope you take some action and, and lead us and um, clean up these clean up these overpasses and underpasses. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. The next speaker, please. Next, we have Stephen Seymour. Hi, it's Sandra Perez Vargas. <laughs> Um, I hope you guys are all doing well tonight. Um, first, I'd like to request that the contract amendment for the city manager be called, uh, pulled from the consent calendar for uh, explanation. Excuse me. Excuse me. That's on the agenda, and that can be addressed at that time. Okay. Thank you for letting me know that. I wasn't sure. And second, I uh, also I want to echo what uh, Bo said about the cleanliness of our city. I've been going around taking a lot of pictures of areas that we've cleaned up. Some are dirty again. But especially when you're taking 380 onto El Camino, um, I took pictures back in December, I think the 20th, reported it to Caltrain's, and I received the automatic, we've received your report, but since then, there's nothing. And the question is, by residents, do we just accept nothing, or do we proceed and um, ask that they do something? And if not, do we do it and then bill them? I know the city has been afraid of getting sued and crossing over to their property line, and I completely get that. But what I don't get is just allowing it to happen and happen and happen. So if you guys can provide us any guidance on this, I mean, we're doing the best we can as residents, and I agree with Bo. I mean, if they're not maintaining their property, we should sue them. It's plain and simple, either, you know, Take, take responsibility. And the same is true of the businesses in town. I mean, they're not taking care of their properties. There's, there's uh, parking lots on San Mateo Avenue that are not taking care of, uh, businesses that are just allowing the overflow of garbage. And there's a place up the street from my house, their parking lot backs up into the residential area. And it's, it's an open dumping site with food. And it's just not respectful to um, our community and um, the same businesses are reported over and over year after year and not just to the SB response or calling in but also to, you know, to the health department but there just seems to be no accountability at any turn so I would love to see us raise our standards in San Bruno and you know say enough already you know we, we deserve to have a decent quality of life and that includes not being assaulted by garbage at every turn and okay well thank you Thank you for your comments. Um, next speaker, please. So, I Next speaker is Paul Wapensky. Can you hear me? Yes, whenever you're ready. Hey, uh, good evening. Uh, I received my notice for the storm drainage and flood protection uh, fee um, in the mail. And there's some things that aren't very clear in it. Uh, I already have a San Bruno storm fee, national pollutant discharge elimination uh, fee on my bill, on my property tax bill. So what's the difference between this and what's being proposed in the current uh, NPDE money, and what is that used for that uh, is not being going to be used for the uh, proposed fee? And the bottom line is, is the fee that's being added to my property tax bill um, going to be included in my assessment? And are the proposed yearly uh, increases only applied to the fee that's being proposed, or is it going to be to my total assessed value? And I'd like those questions answered sometime. Before. I know you're going to have a meeting on it, but that would be something that uh, I'd like to have answered for everybody because it's not clear in the uh, document that was sent to me. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Next speaker, please. Next speaker is Siofra Linden. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, whenever you're ready. Good evening. My name is Shifra Linden, and I'm here on behalf of the Cappuccino High School Environmental Club to address the concern we have for San Bruno's responsibility in fighting the ongoing climate crisis. It's evident that climate change is both a global and local crisis, 
and San Bruno is a city that will see a lot of damage if no action is taken soon. Widespread climate-related impacts are already affecting things like water, energy, ecosystems, and health, and are expected to increase without action. A complication that will be particularly harmful to San Bruno is damage from flooding, especially in neighborhoods around the airport and near the bay. It should be the city's responsibility to ensure its future residents won't have to deal with the catastrophes that will likely take place. And with that, the promise that the city can remain a place that people will want to move to, along with environmental leadership that we currently lack. It's my understanding that three San Bruno residents approached the city council asking for the creation of an environmental sustainability commission, similar to that of many other cities, Having a commission like that would bring this city one step closer to planning and initiating a climate action plan, which is something that every single city in San Mateo County has adopted except for San Bruno. Many of our neighboring cities' climate action plans include agendas and proposals aimed at tackling issues such as greenhouse gas emissions, water conservation, waste management, and transportation emissions. They have and are funding public outreach on the importance of conserving energy recycling, and other issues that residents can address themselves. Many cities are mandating recycling and food composting within local businesses and setting out to install a more accessible electric vehicle charging infrastructure. They are actively updating and continuously addressing their plans to ensure that the community is reaching its goals and staying in line with their plans and the progress the county expects. San Bruno has addressed the issues of flooding and conservation in the general plan, but the effort has not expanded beyond that. This lack of action tells our residents and those residing within San Mateo County that we are not a city willing to put in the work necessary to tackle climate change. As concerned young residents of San Bruno, we ask that a statement on the importance of needed action and a plan should be created to reassure the population of San Bruno that this city will remain a safe and enjoyable place to live. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next speaker, please. The next speaker will be Tim O'Brien. Hi, good evening. It's actually Raina. Hi, Raina. Um, whenever you're ready. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I want to actually make a comment and also an, observ an observation. I have learned that uh, the city conduct some special uh, council meetings um, three to five on Fridays. I'm now, the, the one that I was aware of is on January 22nd. I believe that that time it's not workable for a lot of people that, are, that actually work. So if you can actually accommodate some of us, I would like to participate in those. However, I, I'm at work, so I can participate. And also, you need to post it on nextdoor.com um, or, you know, or San Bruno Now or other, you know, uh, Facebook, social media. So people are aware of um, this meeting so they can provide feedback of what you discussing during those um, meetings. That's one. Another thing is um, I am basically very disappointed how much trash I see in front of apartment buildings, especially of tenants when they move out. They don't have the courtesy to call basically a recology and just leave the items on the street. And it looks appalling how a city is being trashed when people move out. And I think we need to put the burden or find the landlords uh, accountable to take care of these items. I don't think the city should be the one, um, uh, basically, what I'm trying to say, the city be taking care of the finan financial burden to get rid of, discard these items. So it is, I see mattress, chairs, items that the landlord should be uh, responsible to take care of. And I want to see a proactive, um, uh, uh, project from the city to put on landlords. Thank you so much for the opportunity tonight. Thank you for your comments. Next speaker, please. The next speaker is Terry Chavez. Mute. 
just one moment. I'm trying to. There you Hi. are. Hi, Carrie. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, sorry about that. I'm using a different computer. Um, I want to thank the other um, residents that commented on, on, on the trash, um, Bo and um, Sandra and Raina, because I know that trash around the city was a huge problem. And I know, I know at the last city council meeting, you know, I, I, a lot of us thanked everybody who stepped up and volunteered to, to help out with, the, with picking up the trash and cleaning certain neighborhoods. I know there's a once a month um, meeting to clean. I just wanted to mention, um, I'm not sure if any of that, I know I've heard folks mention it's Caltrain property. I'm not sure if any of the property is actually San Mateo County property because I'm looking at um, that property tax dollar the city council presented in August 2019. That's like my go-to little property tax dollar. The city of San Bruno only receives 15 cents out of every tax dollar. Uh, San Mateo County receives 26 cents out of every property tax dollar. That's almost, it's not quite double, but it's almost double from what, from the amount that the city of San Bruno receives from the property taxes. And so I'm just wanted to, to, to mention that if, if there's any property that's owned by the county, I, I think we should hold them accountable. They are receiving almost, they're receiving 26% of all of our property tax dollars. And, and um, I think we need to um, help hold the county responsible for the areas that they own. Uh, thank you for um, allowing me to comment. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next speaker, please. The next speaker is Benjamin Fong. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, whenever you're ready. All right. Hi, my name is Benjamin Fong, and I am speaking on behalf of the Cappuccino Environmental Club. Our club is focused on issues of climate change and any methods to lessen it. And one of the main issues that we want to address is lessening the use of plastics. A lot of local stores, restaurants, and other business businesses have to resort to using plastic bags, utensils, containers, and others as means to save costs. However, plastics contribute to large quantities of waste and is a contributing factor to health hazards. You know, I participated in the cleanup last month and the vast majority of the uh, trash that I picked up was plastic. Now, according to UNEnvironment.org, if current trends continue, our oceans could contain more plastics than fish by 2050. They also informed that by clogging sewers and providing breeding grounds for mosquitoes and pests and also plastic waste, especially plastic bags, this can increase the transmission of vector-borne diseases. Now, this is very shocking to us at Cappuccino Environmental Club because we care what goes on in our city and we want to see change implemented. We also want to do our part to see San Bruno be environmentally friendly and take a stand against plastics. Plastic use is a global issue. However, we can start small, implement local changes, and do our part to ensure that we all live in a clean and healthy environment. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, next speaker, please. Uh, next speaker is Michaela Santos Stevenson. All right, uh, can you hear me? Yes, whenever you're ready. Okay. Uh, hi, uh, good evening, Mayor and Council members. My name is Michaela Santos Stevenson, and I'm the third and final member here to speak on account of Cappuccino Environmental Club. Recently, there was a cleanup organized by Cleaning San Bruno Now, and from what I know, the city provided tools and Recology provided trash cans and disposal service. We'd like to thank all those mentioned, as well as the three council members who attended the cleanup to help. Volunteer opportunities such as this are exactly what we want to see more of in San Bruno moving forward. More frequent cleanups targeting areas in the city where trash is especially problematic could do a lot of good, such as by the reservoir and other delicate wildlife areas. However, there are other opportunities for volunteer work as well. Cleaning storm drains so that the trash does not end up washing out into the bay, for example, is something that we could get started on now, and if organized well, we could do so very efficiently. Projects that we can lead in soon include planting plants and trees that are native to the area. As with all plants, they would assist with erosion control, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and native plants would be able to grow healthier and stronger, doing more good in the long run. It's also worth noting that this would be healthier for the ecosystem because native animals are more at home with those plants. 
More long-term projects that can be worked on can be installing rainwater collection systems to reduce water usage. And although the water collected may not be the safest to drink without treatment, it's perfectly usable for maintaining landscaping and watering plants. That said, there are things that people can do at home rather than go outside. For example, eco bricks. Eco bricks are plastic bottles packed tightly with used plastic to make a reusable building block. They're used for building homes, gardens, furniture, and a lot more. You can pack a lot of plastic into one plastic bottle, and packing, packing your bottles takes a lot less time than one might think, especially if you do it while idly watching a TV show or any other media you enjoy. Ecobricks.org has a lot more information on this, but essentially, through that organization, you can drop off your completed Ecobricks at one of their designated locations listed on their site to be sent off for use in projects where needed. Communities can also practice eco-bricking for their own use, such as in community gardens, and if this practice were introduced to and implemented by San Bruno's residents, we could prevent a significant amount of plastic from ending up loose in the environment while simultaneously using these reusable building blocks for green projects and doing more good than we could have with just recycling. We have lots of other ideas and projects in mind, and we at Cappuccino Environmental Club are very interested in collaborating with you all at San Bernardino City Council on environmental issues going forward. Thank you all for your time. Thank you for your comments. Next speaker, please. Next speaker is Stephen Seymour. Yeah, it really is me this time. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, I would like to first commend the last speaker and Benjamin and Siapra uh, for their interest in the environment. It really is uh, wonderful to hear uh, students in our town um, raise these important issues. And I know there have been many who have brought these things forward, but it seems like the frequency of speakers that are now asking our city to do something about the environment is uh, is coming uh, faster and, and harder in, in recent months. So I, I'd really like to thank them, and I'd also like to thank them for joining the cleanup that, that uh, the community had last month. Um, I want to take this time to let everyone know that we are doing another cleanup and that cleanup will be on Sat Saturday the 20th of this month at 10 o'clock. And it'll take place in the, we'll start in the Caltrain parking lot and we'll be cleaning uh, areas in the avenues and along Huntington. Uh, so we had a wonderful uh, cleanup last time. It's great to hear some speakers talk about it this evening. Uh, and we expect this next one uh, to be equally as successful as the last. Uh, and I'd just like to invite everyone out there. Um, the city was gracious and loaned us pickers and uh, vests and helped pick up uh, some of the garbage that we picked up. And uh, the city will be helping us again uh, this time around. And it's a great event where you can get out and meet people that you haven't met before who are like-minded, who'd like to see our city uh, cleaned and less garbage on the ground. It seems like a lot of People, public comments tonight spoke about the same thing. So if you want to make a dent in the garbage that you see, come join us. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your comments. Next speaker, please. Next speaker is Jeffrey Tong. Hello. Hello, Jeffrey, whenever you're ready. I just wanted to reiterate my last uh, uh, request at the last uh, city council meeting to have the uh, city council um, ac acknowledge the severity of climate change and to create an environmental sustainability uh, commission. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. I see we have our last speaker up. Uh, please go ahead. Yes, the last speaker is Riley Gibbon. Hello. Hello, whenever you're ready. Hi, right, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to just talk about a couple of things real quick. Cleaning is one of them. Everybody pretty much touched down on that. And I think it is in our best interest as a member of Cleaning San Bruno now to 
associate ourselves with Cappuccino's Environmental Club. I think um, having a lot of young people who are um, worried about the environment and want to get involved is extremely beneficial to our city, especially now with um, the cleanups getting larger and larger. So that'll be something the city can look forward to is a very efficient, larger group of uh, cleaning. And like had Steven had mentioned, there's going to be another cleaning up January 20th. I highly recommend everybody come out. It's a great time. You're cleaning the city and it feels good for yourself. Um, yes, and then transitioning to the other topic regarding marijuana. I would just like to know if anything has been progressed or anything has been talked about because recently Burlingame is not wasting any time. Clearly they're already accepting businesses and delivery uh, methods. So I think San Bruno should really consider moving forward on this and not waiting because before you know it, it's, it's going to be too late. If Burlingame opens up before us, which it seems like they will, San Bruno will be set back another 10 years and it'll just be too much trouble. So please consider it. The, the city needs it. We all need it. And it's extremely beneficial. So thank you. Thank you for your comments. And thank you everyone for being here tonight and, and speaking and uh, sharing with us your thoughts. Okay, so we're going to move on to item number four, which is uh, announcements and presentations. And just for council and for uh, the viewing uh, public, once we are concluded with announcements and presentations, I'm going to move under conduct of business, move up item 6B as in boy. And that's the resolution canceling the previously approved water and wastewater rate increase. Uh, reason for that is we have two folks that are, uh, you know, uh, one who's the acting or not acting, but two consultants, uh, one from the city for finance and another for this topic. And obviously the longer they sit and wait, that uh, costs us the city money. So in order to ensure that we get that taken care of quickly and uh, uh, wish them thanks once they're concluded, I'm going to move that up. I want to give everybody a heads up for that. With that, let's move on to uh, item A, update on COVID-19 response efforts. Jennifer Dionis. Yes, thank you, Mayor. We're just pulling up the presentation now. Um, good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is Jennifer Dianos, and I'm the Assistant to the City Manager. And here this evening to provide you a COVID-19 update on behalf of the EOC Public Information Team. This evening, I will go over our current status, um, our county statistics, testing and vaccine information, and a short preview of a few virtual programs the City is offering. I will be available for questions at the end of the presentation. San Mateo County remains in the purple or the widespread tier of the blueprint for a safer economy. This status has not changed since the last update to you last month. As you can see on the screen, our county metrics are listed by the state and were updated earlier today. Our adjusted case rate is currently at 15.4, a positivity rate of 3.8, and a health equity quartile positivity rate at 6.5. These represent the criteria for movement within the tiers of the blueprint. There's a lot of information on the screen. Um, I realize that, but I did want to show you uh, where we are versus what is required for us to move to the next tier. So looking at this criteria, we currently meet two of the three categories to move to the lower tier. However, all three must be met before moving. Thus, we remain at the uh, widespread level. Regards to local statistics, for San Mateo County, there are 37,139 total cases in the county and a total of 447 deaths. The graph titled Cases by Episode Date in the middle of the screen demonstrates a decline in new cases, but that does not mean to let your guard down, so please continue to wear your mask, stay your distance, and wash your hands. In San Bruno, there are a total of 2,057 cases reported as of February 4th. And you can see by the shading on the map that it's relative within the county. And lastly, I've included a newer dashboard that was set up by the county. I think that the last report out included this information as well. It has data related to vaccinations within our county. So currently there are 84,783 vaccinated 
and just under 20,000 that have completed the entire series. Um, to the right of the screen, you'll see the very distribution providers in our area, um, and there's both Pfizer and Moderna vaccines that are being administered. Uh, before I go into a little bit more about vaccines, I want to mention that the county has transitioned their COVID testing sites to locations other than San Mateo County Event Center, which has housed it for several months now. And one of those locations um, is located in San Bruno. The site that was previously used as a mobile testing site every other week is now offering drive-through testing. Um, that testing is offered Tuesday through Saturday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And the location is Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, located at 975 Saint Lane. This test is for adults and children ages five and older. Oops, I got ahead of myself there. Um, and appointments are required. The appointment uh, link is on the screen. It's A-V-E-L-L-I-N-O-C-O-V-2.com, which is a mouthful, but you can also link to it through the county site, and that's smcgov.org forward slash testing. The city continues to also partner with the county to offer local self-administered tests on Saturday, and that's from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. It's currently scheduled through the end of February, and scheduling is re-evaluated on a monthly basis by our EOC team. We're currently serving a range from about 150 to 200 people each Saturday, and we've gotten up to 350 on, on one of those weekends. The site is located at 530 Huntington and is also open for adults um, and children ages five and older. You can link uh, to the schedule and to uh, make an appointment by visiting sanbruno.ca.gov forward slash local testing. For the self-administered test, it is important to note that test takers should not eat, drink, or smoke 20 minutes prior to taking the test as it may affect the results. Um, and here, I'm, I'm hoping that most of our residents and community members are already signed up for the city manager's e-newsletter, and, and if not, please subscribe on our website. But in the most recent edition, um, there was an update on vaccines. The primary question everyone seems to be asking is when and where can I be vaccinated? The answer can vary depending on personal circumstances, including age and insurance. However, most residents will receive their vaccine from their primary care provider um, as soon as they're eligible to and supply allows. Um, eligibility is set by federal and state guidelines to ensure safe and equitable distribution. To be notified when you're eligible to receive the vaccine, there are a couple of different tools to use. And I'm not sure that the tools crease, uh, cross one another at this time, and so the best recommendation is to sign up or use all of them just to ensure that you're notified timely because uh, you wouldn't want to miss the opportunity. So first is the state notification system, which is called My Turn. You can sign up at myturn.ca.gov. The county has also established a notification system, which I've linked in the presentation. The direct link is very long, so I'm, I'm not going to read it um, out loud, but I do recommend that you go to the county health site, that's smchealth.org forward slash COVID vaccines. And on that link, you'll find a, a direct link to the notification system as well as other valuable information on this process. Uh, the county has provided information on the current distribution of vaccinations as of February 5th, and you'll see that in the graphic here on the slide. Um, this includes phase 1A, the categories of healthcare workers and long-term care residents. It's approximately 50,000 individuals. And phase 1B for adults 75 and over, 65 and over, residents of vulnerable communities, first responders, food and agriculture, teachers and school staff, and that's approximately 167 individuals there. Um, these numbers are also included in the above um, vaccination dashboard that we just looked at. Uh, the county remains committed to ensuring those that want the vaccine will receive the vaccine when they're eligible. So this process is all contingent on vaccine availability and can change with very short notice. So it's important to check with your provider frequently and sign up for the notifications Large vaccination sites in our region are operating when a large amount of doses are available. So be sure to sign up um, so you're alerted timely. The county has also put together a data page that shows how many residents in a community are vaccinated. In San Bruno, there's just under 4,500 individuals that have been vaccinated. 
Um, but remember, even though uh, you receive a shot or know somebody that has, um, it's important to continue to take the precautionary measures to prevent the spread of COVID. So wear your mask in public, keep your distance, and wash your hands. Uh, next, I'll go over a few recreational activities for you and your family. Um, city playgrounds remain open with modifications. There is signage located at parks and, and near the play structures as a reminder to play safe, plan ahead, and know when to stay home. If you or anyone in your family is feeling under the weather, please stay home. Basketball courts, tennis courts, the dog park, public restrooms, and practice play on athletic fields all remain open. That has not changed. Um, however, picnic sites, drinking fountains, indoor facilities, rentals, um, competitive play on the athletic fields are all not allowed. Um, these are reviewed by our EOC team regularly to ensure safety compliance for our community. And since many are at home and, and may not um, be comfortable out um, at the parks, we do offer a March Rec in a Bag. This includes themed crafts that can keep your family busy. Each bag is $20 and includes instructions and supplies for five projects that you can do safely at home. Um, you can register online at sambruno.ca.gov forward slash, forward slash, excuse me, rec sign up. Our library team is offering stories of uh, my people with Kirk Waller, an award-winning storyteller. Kirk Waller will virtually share African and African-American folktale legend and history through music, movement, and singing. Pre-registration is required for this library event and um, it's available online at appointment.sambrinolibrary.org. And as you know, our small businesses are what help make our community, our character, and our vitality. So we want to help support them. So shop local, eat local, support our local businesses at any opportunity that you can. And lastly, please be sure to stay connected. Um, sign up for emergency notifications through SMC Alert and follow us on social media. All are linked on this slide and can also be found on our website. Um, that concludes my presentations, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Jennifer, um, for your report. And I'm going to turn now for questions and Vice Mayor Medina. Yes, uh, thank you for that report, Jennifer. Um, a lot of information there. I mean, most important, most importantly, everybody continue to be safe. Um, the question I have for staff is for some clarity regarding uh, parking enforcement. Uh, street sweeping and 72 hour enforcement that that uh, uh, that is now uh, being enforced and just wanted to make sure everybody was aware of that. Um, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Yes, that has come up and obviously it has a gamut of uh, people liking that it. it was suspended, people not liking it, but uh, city staff, can you please clarify? Yes, uh, sure. Uh, Council Member uh, Medina, uh, City Council and, and community members. Uh, Council Member Medina is correct. The city has resumed enforcement of uh, ticketing as well as uh, street sweeping uh, enforcement during the uh, during the street sweeping days um, uh, in both sides of the community. And so uh, we do want um, uh, cars moved. And uh, we are also now enforcing the 72 hour rule. Thank you. Council Member Salazar. So I had a question about um, you know, violations of, of the rules. And I, I got a, an email over the weekend from a resident who saw a large gathering in City Park where people, it was a large group, people weren't wearing masks. And I was wondering if there was any uh, advice to the public about, you know, is, is the city enforcing? Should, is that something that they should be reporting? Or is it um, uh, something that we should notify the county about? And obviously by the time they were to do something about it, the people would probably be gone. So I'm just wondering if there's any advice on how to handle those situations. Council Member Salazar, uh, one of the most uh, difficult things to enforce are the mask rules in our parks because there is an exemption uh, on wearing a mask when exercising. 
And so people using our parks uh, are taking in recreational activities, um, even walking uh, uh, can, can do so without a mask. And so we do routinely receive those calls uh, and provide that information. The county does have a reporting mechanism for businesses uh, that people observe uh, violating the health and safety orders. And that information uh, has been provided and is on uh, the city's website and you can link directly to that uh, from the city's homepage. Okay. Yeah, and no, I, I appreciate the, uh, the the difficulty in enforcing some of those things and distinguishing which activities are which. So uh, I appreciate all the information on the report and uh, well done. Thank you. Council Member Mason. Thank you for the report. Um, just echoing um, Council Member Salazar, I, I thought at one point we had um, talked about putting some signs up at the park. I know San, the city of San Mateo has signs up at their parks and they do require uh, masks to be worn at their parks. Um, and in addition, it says um, you must maintain six, uh, six foot distance. Um, so I don't know if that's an ordinance then maybe the city manager would have to respond whether that, I mean the city attorney, whether that's an ordinance that San Mateo has enacted. Um, but I was recently at a San Mateo park and the signs were, were very evident and they were very clear all over the park. So go ahead, city manager. So council member Mason, you're exactly correct. Uh, we have ordered additional signage for the parks. Uh, we expect them to arrive today uh, and we will uh, put additional signage at all parks. There is existing signage uh, at our play structures and at some of the entrances to parks uh, and taking suggestions from the community uh, and the council, we did order additional uh, signs and they have just uh, have not arrived yet. Thank you. Okay, any other um, questions? Seeing none, we uh, thank you again, staff. And we'll move on to item B, receive update from San Mateo County Mosquito and Vector Control District. And I believe we're going to have a representative from the district. And I don't know the title, so I apologize. Mr. Stevenson, uh, please, the floor is yours. All right, I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, let's see here. All right, can everyone hear me? Yes. All right, so my name is Casey Stevenson, and I work for San Mateo County Mosquito and Vector Control. I'm the field supervisor. Uh, I was asked to come here and kind of just discuss district services by our, we have a board of trustees. So our trustee for San Bruno, Robert Rico, asked us to, asked me to come here today and just kind of talk about our district services and what we provide to the city of San Bruno and San Mateo County. Um, so our district has been around since 1916. We've been protecting public health since then. Um, kind of our mission, you know, we try to safeguard the health and comfort of the citizens of San Mateo County through a planned program to monitor and reduce, reduce mosquitoes and other vectors. We are an independent special district funded by property tax and special assessments. So if you look at your property tax bill, you will see us on there. Um, all services we provide at no charge to residents of San Mateo County. Um, just kind of a few things that we do at our district, a brief overview. Obviously our bread and butter is mosquitoes. We do tons of inspections and treatments for all over San Mateo County and in San Bruno. Um, some of the few of the other things we do that people might not know about, we do yellow jacket and wasp removal. These usually start popping up in about May and you usually go all the way into, into October. So if someone has a yellow jacket or wasp nest on their property, please give us a call. Uh, and another thing we do, we do a lot of rodent inspections. We do those for cities, we do them for residential properties. And for that, we're kind of just going out to people's properties and kind of looking, they might think rats are getting in some out. So we'll kind of um, assess their property and give them a nice inspection report and kind of be like, hey, this is what you can do to make your property less attractive to rodents. Um, like I said, we do tons of mosquito treatments. So this is kind of um, a comparison of what we've done the last four years in San Mateo County. And it stays relatively the same over the years. You know, we do tons of site visits. So in 2020, we did about 28,000 site visits. And during those site visits of those, we treated about 9,500 sites. 
in San Mateo County, we have about 8,500 potential mosquito breeding sites that we uh, um, look after, basically. Um, just in comparison, you know, in 2010, our staff performed about 22,000 mosquito treatments. And you see in 2020, we did about 9,500 mosquito treatments. Um, we've kind of um, lowered our mosquito treatments over time. And one of the reasons was we put an increased emphasis on educating property owners about the importance of eliminating mosquito habitats. So, you know, kind of just telling them, hey, you know, this container here that holds water, can breed mosquitoes, can cause a lot of issues for your neighbors, let alone yourself. So I think we've been able to educate the public about the uh, potential dangers of mosquitoes and just what a nuisance it is actually. And then over time, when I started doing mosquito control in 2008, um, the products we used to control the juvenile mosquitoes would only last about four to six weeks. Um, but currently today we have products that can last up to five months in the specific water source that we're treating. So that's kind of reduced the amount of treatments we had to do over time. And since our district has become, you know, we've a lot more people know about us now, we've had a high volume of service calls have increased over time. So this extra time frees us up to respond to um, a service call within 24 to 48 hours. So if you call our district on a Monday night saying you have a mosquito breeding or you think there's uh, mosquitoes biting you, we'll be coming out the next day. Um, and also allow staff, staff to conduct more surveillance and control and more mosquitoes in more areas of San Mateo County. So, you know, we're trying to reach everywhere in the county, basically, and this helps us control West Nile virus and any invasive species of mosquitoes that might enter our county, such as the Aedes aegypti. Um, just a little uh, background on San Bruno, kind of what we do in this area for mosquito control. Um, we have about 200 actively monitored mosquito, potential mosquito breeding sites that we monitor regularly. And in 2020, we had about 61 service calls. Um, this is kind of just a map of the city of San Bruno, kind of, it shows the dispersion of our mosquito sites. So you can see they can, they range from all the way from 101 all the way up to Highway 35. So they're pretty evenly distributed throughout that area. Some of the sites we come across if we're at residential properties are usually like an abandoned fish pond, which we can put mosquito fish in and they would control the mosquito larva. Um, and other things, you know, find random containers on people's properties that after the rainy season, people might not know about that can breed tons of mosquitoes also. These are things we like to educate the public about on how they can control the mosquitoes. Um, we also have a lot of natural sources in San Bruno and we call them seasonal impounds. So these are things that fill in with rainwater. And uh, if that water sits there long enough, they can tend to breed mosquitoes also. And, you know, we are in an urban environment. So a lot of these natural areas back up the neighborhoods. And so if these mosquitoes go off, it can cause a real problem for these neighborhoods. And then talking municipal wise, you know, um, a lot of storm drains all throughout camp, all throughout the county can breed mosquitoes, especially uh, the specific mosquito that can transmit West Nile virus. So we have a seasonal crew completely dedicated to treating all of the storm drains in San Mateo County during the summertime. Um, in one month, all eight of them can treat up to between 50 and 60,000 catch basins in a month. Um, like I said, back to service requests, you know, it's a 24 to 48 hour response time. We do get a lot of mosquito calls, a lot of rodent calls where we're just doing inspections and advising the residents on how to make their properties less attractive to them. Um, we collect dead birds. So that's a big thing. Please, if you find a dead bird, call us and we'll come pick up the dead bird. And that's one of our ways of testing for West Nile virus in San Mateo County. And also we do a lot of insect identification. So if you have a bug on your property and you're not sure what it is, you can call us and we can come pick it up. You can email us a photograph of it and we can assess your situation and just give you more information about that insect. Um, Briefly, just kind of, this is a service request by city. I just really want to focus on San Bruno and kind of the, the most um, requests we get for the city of San Bruno are about mosquitoes in 2020. We had 14 mosquito calls. Um, we had 12 standing water calls. So that's kind of like a see, see something, say something. You know, if there's any stagnant water anywhere, it has the potential to breed mosquitoes. So please give us a call if you see something like that. And then yellow jacket calls, you know, if, if you ever stepped on a yellow jacket or been stung by a yellow jacket, it doesn't feel good, you know, and we do that to protect the public. Um, 
So please give us a call if you see any of these things on here. Um, and kind of noted a little distribution map of all of our service requests in the city of San Bruno for the year 2020. You see, once again, they're pretty evenly distributed. Um, and just kind of an example of some of the things we see when we're doing inspection of residential properties. This is obviously an extreme case, but there's probably like 30 containers here and they're all holding water. Um, if these were to go left untended, untreated, not dumped out, they could produce thousands of mosquitoes that would not only affect this property owner, but is also affecting the surrounding neighbors, which could make them really upset. So, you know, dump it out if you got it. Um, also, wonder, water under a house, you know, how many people really ever go under their house to look underneath it? But um, we find this fairly often in multiple cities throughout San Mateo County. So when uh, some properties, the ground settles and then these pipes kind of shear and break and cause a leak. And over time, this water accumulates and this can produce millions of mosquitoes. Um, so, you know, periodically look under your house. If you're noticing mosquitoes, just give us a call. You know, we're going to go house to house until we find a problem. We don't stop. Um, and then once again, creeks, uh, creeks can over time and in the summer, you know, when they tend to slow down, they can produce mosquitoes. So as a district, we do a lot of legwork in the early spring. We trim these creeks out and make sure there's no blockage of water. So the water can continuously flow. Um, so that kind of reduces the amount of larviciding material or pesticide we have to put in this water during the summertime when there are pockets of it. And then kind of one of the largest natural areas in San Bruno, it kind of spans Millbury and San Bruno is Mills Field. Um, and our technician for the city, he does tons of control work out here. There's about 32 to 40 acres of um, tule ponds that can breed mosquitoes and in the summertime, basically, and in the wintertime. So he usually starts in January and he's out here every single week checking all of these areas to see if mosquitoes are being produced. Um, this is a very sensitive habitat, and it's very hard to access for it. As you can see with these pictures here, you can see the cattail ponds are completely overgrown. So one of the ways we treat these, um, starting in July, we bring a helicopter in that drops a, um, a dry larviciding material directly into the water that can control the mosquitoes for up to a month. Um, so we do that monthly starting in July, August, September, October, and that helps control the mosquitoes. And then they do, once they get colder, they do slow down their growth process. Um, sometimes, you know, this was this summer 2020, that's me with the hose right there, spraying, spraying a liquid larvicide into the tulip ponds. Um, as the summer progresses in Mills Field, things do dry up. So it's not fiscally responsible to bring out a helicopter. That's a pretty expensive treatment for only five acres of property when before we were treating 32 acres. So we have some pretty heavy equipment that we can bring out and drive safely down the road through Mills Field and treat this accordingly. Um, so that's pretty much it for my talk. I, like I said, I thank you for having me here. This is kind of an example of us spraying. And I would like to thank our trustee for setting this up. And if you guys have, feel free to have any questions, you, the, our email address is there and our uh, district phone number. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Stevens, for your report. And if you could um, stop sharing your screen, and thank you, sir. Um, yeah. Any yeah. Uh, uh, questions? I see Council Member Hamilton. Uh, not a question, just a brief comment. I had no idea the breadth of, um, of services that was that's being provided by the um, Mosquito and Vector Control District. So I really appreciate this um, this uh, presentation and. Uh, encourage uh, the residents and attendants to um, use the services that you described. Thank you very much. Councilmember Mason. I, I just wanted to thank you for responding to the email with uh, there were a number of questions that had been raised um, and I just wanted to thank you for that and I also want to thank you for your passion. Who knew mosquitoes could be so exciting? So thank you. <laughs> um, I love my job so it shows. Um, and, and I want to say, and I know obviously under COVID times, there is not the ability, but I believe council member Salazar has been, as well as I, we, you go by Rollins Road, they had an open house. It was very informative and you could see the various animals, you could see the equipment that's used. And I will tell you, 
Uh, you can drive by it, maybe not even know it's there, but when you go inside and see all that is done and tracked and, and how it operates, uh, it's amazing. And I know they allow, once we get out of this, and we will, uh, they do allow folks to come by, visit, and do open houses. And I would encourage anybody who hasn't done that, uh, you would even learn uh, much more about what, what they offer and what they do. So, Mr. Yeah. Steven, go ahead, sir. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say thank you for that. You know, we have a great website also that you guys can check out in the meantime during this COVID times. But, yeah, definitely please come out whenever. Our district's always open 8 to 4.30, Monday through Friday, except in COVID time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but thank you again. Uh, please pass on our thanks and uh, also take this opportunity, as you mentioned, your board, our board member, to you, Robert, who – uh, make sure on an annual basis we kept uh, we keep informed and we know what's going on and so we appreciate and please pass on our thanks to everybody there uh, that does the work they do. Thank you, sir. All right. Enjoy the rest of your evening. All right. You too. All right. We're going to move on to item C uh, under announcements and presentations. Receive presentation on city utility billing process. City manager. Good evening, uh, Mayor, Council members, and member of the public. Uh, I'm here tonight to provide a presentation that's titled Understanding San Bruno's Utility Bills. So uh, I'm here tonight in two capacities, one as your city manager, but also as your interim finance director uh, in, until we uh, fill that position, which should be shortly. So since uh, what the city council knows is that since we launched our effort to improve deficiencies in our stormwater system, We've had a spike in questions about some of our other utilities. And so we're here tonight to talk about those utilities that we bill for on a uh, regular basis, uh, bi-monthly basis. And so those are water, sewer, and trash. Uh, Stormwater, as we all know, is on the annual property tax. So our objective for tonight is to provide the city council and the community with an overview of the city's bi-monthly utility billing process thereby providing an answer to one of the commonly asked questions that I know you receive and that we receive here, which is why do I receive such a large utility bill from the city of San Bruno every two months? Uh, we get that question, and, and so let's uh, pull back the cover a little bit and attack that. And so let me also say tonight is not an in-depth presentation about our utility rates and the structures. We're really talking about the utility billing process but we'll also have some comparisons. And so the agenda for this presentation is structured as follows. We'll have a background. We'll talk about the uh, bi-monthly bill. We'll see a few sample bills. We'll see a billing process comparison with a, lot of, with a few of our neighboring jurisdictions. And then we'll look at a few rate comparisons and then I'll provide a summary. So launching into the background, uh, our finance department here in the city of San Bruno administers a bi-monthly billing process for water, sewer, and trash services. That is both sending paper bills and paper list bills. Approximately, uh, we, we have, uh, for all three of those utilities, approximately 15,000 uh, individual uh, customer accounts. Our public works department is the department that operates and maintains our water and sewer enterprises. Uh, and Recology is our contract provider for residential and commercial waste and recycling services, but we do deal on their behalf as per the city's contract with Recology. So frequently asked question, why, is, why do I receive a bill uh, from the city of San Bruno every two months that's so large? What I want to submit to you that the primary answer to that question is related more in how we bill than the actual amount of the bill. Uh, and through this presentation, uh, I would like to provide a, a few uh, data points to articulate that. So first off, let's talk about the bill. It's actually not one bill. It is six bills in one. It is a bi-monthly bill that is actually comprised of six charges. Two months worth of water charges, two months worth of sewer, and two months worth of trash. For residential customers, we provide uh, two payment options. They can pay in full or they can pay over two equal installments. And uh, there is a actual bill that, that is up on the screen, but on the text, I wanna highlight the billing cycle. And so this is a residential bill 
And just to give you a little lay of the land, the service period is from November 21st, 2020 through January 20th, 2021. So a 60 day period. The statement was issued on January 27th with the first payment due 30 days after the end of the service period. So on February 20th, and the very last payment should the resident choose to do so 20 days after the first payment uh, on March 10th, which is industry standard to structure those payments that way and was uh, 20 days apart. Now let's uh, take a quick look at a sample utility bill. And this is a bi-monthly statement uh, for a residential customer. So, uh, quickly, I want to highlight in the uh, top left-hand area, we provide a, uh, a summary of utility, actually water consumption. Uh, and so in this case, uh, the total consumption is uh, averaging around 16 units. On the top uh, right-hand side, there's account information. Uh, some information on this particular bill has been blocked out, but there circled in red is where uh, we provide the service period. I'll pause there by saying that we can actually improve on the structure of this bill because for many of our customers, what we've heard is it's actually not clear that they're receiving a two-month bill. Uh, and so in very small print in the top right-hand corner is the only place that we really articulate that this is a two-month bill. Uh, and then there are the two payment subs that are shown here on, in the lower right-hand area. And then on the rear, on the back of the bill, we provide uh, significant information on uh, the water rate. Uh, we explain our tiered water structure. We explain both the fixed and consumption charges for uh, sewer or wastewater as well. Uh, and we also provide information on the structure of the total charges for garbage. There's also a table that shows the precise date that your meter was read, both at the beginning of the period and the, and the end of the period, as well as general billing information. So why do we issue a bi-monthly bill? Well, the answer is quite simple. It saves money uh, and labor, thereby reducing costs to our rate payers and saving valuable tax dollars. Each bi-monthly cycle costs the city approximately $5,200 for printing, postage, and service fees. Does not include labor. If we were to convert to a monthly billing process, we would essentially double those charges. And so by having a bi-monthly process, we are saving our, our rate payers in approximately $31,000 a year, simply by billing uh, bi-monthly, by issuing a bi-monthly statement, but giving our rate payers the options to pay monthly. So that's, that's answer one. It's a bi-monthly bill, um, uh, but you're given the option uh, to pay in, in two installments. The next part of the answer is um, to why is the bill so large here? It's really the structure. We are somewhat unique amongst our neighboring cities in that we are the only agency that sends a bill on our letterhead in our name for all three of these utilities, water, sewer, and trash. And so if you were to assume that the rates were nearly equivalent amongst the five uh, jurisdictions that are shown here, San Bruno, South San Francisco, Millbrae, Pacifica, and San Francisco, we're the only city where that comes in one bi-monthly statement. And so there's a, even if the rates were equivalent, there's a feeling that I'm paying the city a significant amount, whereas in other cities, uh, the residents or property owners are not paying that to the city, simply by the structure of it. And so what's shown here is in South San Francisco, water is billed by Cal Water or the Westboro Water District on a monthly basis. Sewer is billed by the city or the Westboro Water District on property tax, so annual um, on the county property tax roll and trash is built by South San Francisco scavenger every three months. Millbrae is the closest to us. They are issuing bi-monthly bills for water and sewer under the city's header, but garbage is billed by South San Francisco scavenger, who is their contract provider. 
In the city of Pacifica, the North Coast County Water District provides a bi-monthly water bill. The city uh, provides property tax, uh, for, um, I'm sorry, provides sewer on the property tax bill. And just as a reminder to the public, that means you're not getting the bill every month or, or every two months. That is on your property tax. So it's one statement listed with all of the other charging agencies on the property tax bill. And then Recology is billed bi-monthly. And in the city of San Francisco, there is San Francisco Water, Power, and Sewer, which is actually a division of the San Francisco PUC. They issue monthly bills for water and sewer, uh, and trash is monthly by Recology. So uh, I, I, I want the council and the public to take away that part of the, the reason is because we are doing the billing. Uh, and it's all on the city's letterhead, and we do it bi-monthly, which gives the appearance of a larger bill than just issuing monthly statements. Uh, so next, I wanted to provide a sample bi-monthly bill by type. Uh, and uh, the three types that are shown, uh, staff tells me, are relative um, examples of what uh, a commercial uh, account and a residential and a multifamily account pays, but it's not the average, but it is a close uh, approximation. And so uh, the first one is a commercial account for a, re for a restaurant that are issued monthly statements. And so that is a total monthly statement of $717. A single family residence, uh, typically in our city, has a bi-monthly statement of somewhere between uh, 450 to $550, and what's shown here is $550, uh, $7. And a multi-unit, a multi-family individual unit account um, has uh, a typical statement around, 300 and, uh, around $300, and what's shown here is $334. And again, all of these um, charges are based on consumption, for water and sewer, as well as fixed charges. And for trash, it's based on the size of the trash receptacles uh, you have and whether you're a resident or a, or, a, or a commercial customer. So with that information, let's do a quick look at where we fall with respect to rates. Uh, and so this information is provided to the city council uh, every time we do a, a water or sewer uh, rate study. Uh, for this presentation, we did have our consultant uh, freshen up the rates, uh, and so these are accurate as of January uh, 21. And so we do have a presentation coming up next where we'll talk about uh, canceling the prior plan 5% rate increases for water and sewer. These charts are replicated there, and Public Works Director Jimmy Tan will go into uh, more detail. Just at a high level, what I want to point out here is that we provide uh, benchmark information for other cities and agencies in the peninsula and for water at a uh, six unit uh, water consumption count, the bill in San Bruno will be $81.41. $81.41. It's nearly equivalent to the average uh, of all of the agencies here, which is 81 uh, 64. And so our charges are on par. It's a little bit more. It's about $7 more than the median, uh, but we are totally within the standard deviation. And so uh, our charges for water are on par with neighboring agencies. The other thing I want to point out with this, with this chart for both water and sewer is that the specific charge that an agency may have for water and sewer is really dependent on the operating costs to maintain their system, as well as the fixed charges to uh, replace and maintain capital infrastructure. And as we know here, back in 1718, the city of San Bruno actually had to increase our rates in order to cover needed capital improvements. And so while you can look at this chart and say, well, we're not on the low, on the low end, another way to look at it is say we are within the average, and, and, and the same thing is true here shown for sewer. Uh, the average is $100.26, and our charge is $100.31. Um, and we are uh, about $3 higher than the median. So again, our cost is based on, 
our, our charges based on our, our, our operating costs and our capital expenditures. But overall, we are in line uh, with our peers. Next, we have a comparison for trash. Uh, and this chart was, to, was provided to the city council on March 10th, 2020, uh, uh, at the last recology rate increase. And so what we know from the data that's shown here is that the peer rate average for a 32 gallon toller, the most common residential toller, uh, it is $33 um, for the average and the median. And we are just below that at $31.93. And so again, our charges for trash are on par with our peers. And so in conclusion, sort of in answering that question, why are city bi-monthly utility bills so large? Uh, I really want to submit that we're sort of unique here in that we do the direct billing with our logo on our letterhead for water, sewer, and trash on a bi-monthly basis. Um, residents are, uh, as a reminder, provided uh, the ability to pay in two equal installments. But that bi-monthly bill, again, is six charges. It's two months worth of water, two months worth of sewer, and two months worth of trash. And overall, our rates are on par with our peer agencies. Now, again, that doesn't mean that a resident receiving that bill saying, you know, this is a large bill, and I talk to people that live in other cities, and they don't get this. That's true. But when you truly break it down, um, it's really related more to the structure uh, of, of the bill. Lastly, we can improve on format and layout to provide better clarity. Uh, and it, it is not lost on me that if we need to give a presentation to explain our utility bills, we can make our utility bills a little clearer. Uh, and so uh, we will work on that. And so next steps, uh, because this is uh, uh, and has been um, a question that, I, that we received, we will do additional public outreach on the city's utility billing process. Um, we will also include an explanation of this bill and other related information in an effort that we're developing. Uh, we are developing a new resident welcome package. So when we have a new uh, customer sign up for a utility account, we can provide them with information uh, and, 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 and place this in place uh, why our bill is structured that way in context. Um, we will assess and implement format changes to, again, provide a greater clarity on the structure of our utility bill. And we will also strive to convert additional customers to paperless. Uh, right now, of those 15,000 um, uh, individual utility accounts, about half are on paperless. And so if we can convert uh, another 25%, uh, that will create a significant savings. And we will certainly undertake that as a work effort. As a, as a work effort. So with that, um, I want to conclude the presentation. Uh, there's no action scheduled for council tonight. Uh, we just wanted to provide that information. Uh, happy to take any questions. Okay. Thank you for bringing back the screen real quick. And I know it could be considered a pass through, but by us uh, putting on the same bill recology, they also help contribute toward the cost of the mailing. That's true. City manager. That is, that is true, Mayor. Okay. All right. Um, let, oh, sorry, folks. Switch over to panelists. Council Member Hamilton. Apologize for the delay. Oh, no problem. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, City Manager, for the for the presentation. The um, uh, more of a of a comment than a question. I, I, I I'm, I'm glad to see that that um, you're looking into um, formatting changes for the bill. Um, uh, one suggestion that I would that I would make when going through that effort would be to, um, you know, right now when you look at the bill and I'm looking, at, I I brought mine out uh, as you were, as you were going through it, um, is just to be just to have simple subtotals. How much of this bill is water? How much of this bill is sewer? How much of this bill is recology? Um, right now, there's four lines for water that I need to add up in my head to know how much the you know what the percent of my bill is for water. Um, I think that would be something simple, and and you can gain the space because the 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 graph for unit consumption is on the front and on the back, the exact same graph. So there's you know, there's all kinds of room for improvement there. But I would I would just suggest that having some you know big bold subtotals of this is what you're paying for each of the each 
of the big three of the three pillars would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Not seeing any more council hands. I do see a member of the public and would ask the city clerk if uh, you could bring him in, please. Uh, yes, Malcolm Robinson. Can you hear me now? Yes, whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, thank you, city council, for allowing me to speak. Um, I should put my glasses on. Um, my concern over the water sewage um, uh, garbage bill is not formatting. It's not a formatting issue. It's the cost keeps going up. The cost of everything in San Bernardino keeps going up, and I'll save some of this for later. But my utility bill has gone up 10% a year. So since uh, we've had this city manager, it's gone up 30%. So so why is that? We're, you admit we're paying above average prices for the peninsula. Um, you know, I'm just not seeing where this, this money's going. The, the services provided are lessening. I do water aerobics. You cut the water aerobics budget 20% and cut a month out of the service. This year we didn't even have water aerobics. Pacifica does. They seem to be able to get their act together. So why this increase in costs and everything from water to cable to garbage to flood protection? Um, the library is closed, closed for months. I have to go to Burlingame to go to the library. <clears throat> so. To me, this is symptomatic of a large scale, you know, um, <clears throat> trying to find the right words, large scale increase of living in, in this town. Now, I talked to the city manager about it. He said, don't talk to me anymore. Talk to the city council. Well, city council, you're the guys we elect to manage our city, to, to better manage our city. And I look for you all to dig into why the costs of everything are going up in this town and please get it under control. Um, because if you guys can't, we'll have to find somebody else who can. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your comment. We have another, uh, we have one more uh, speaker. If you could bring that speaker in now, please. Uh, the, Mr. Uh, yes, one moment. Um, Jeffrey Tong, I'm trying to bring you in here. Give me a little problem. Hi, this is Jeffrey Tong speaking. Um, Jovan Gurgan mentioned that San Bruno rates are divided into six parts. He also mentioned that compared with other cities, we are relatively on par with them. But looking at our utility bills, water and garbage, um, compared from past years, it has gone up significantly and we haven't used more water. We haven't used more. In fact, we use less water. Um, our garbage bill seems to have gone up significantly as well. Part of it, they claim, is because we are recycling more or they're, they're collecting more for recycling. But what are, if you want to save money, uh, teach people how to compost instead of collecting more. Um, I, I think you're, you're just doing too much unnecessary things. One of the greatest uh, things that we probably could use, <coughs> excuse me, is collect community trash, people throwing away uh, sofas and beds and other things out there. Um, but for the the people at large, we could reduce the amount that they charge by um, reallocating uh, how we uh, collect, uh, especially with recycling. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Okay, let's bring it back to City Council. Council Member Mason. Yeah, I, I just wanted to ask, let me put my hand down. Um, these, this last set of increases, they came before the council before I was on the council. And I, I am curious to know, cause I've heard varying, uh, degrees of this. How long have these increases been in place? Um, is question one. And then question two is, uh, when does this last round of five year increases end? Um, you know, excuse me. Um, since we have that item next about the water 
uh, wastewater rates and we have people waiting for us on that topic. I think that might be there. I think this is about the layout of the bill. Okay, that's fine. However, however you want to handle it. Yeah, since we have them standing by. Vice Mayor Medina. Um, I can wait for uh, for the consultant. I, I think basically what I would like to say is um, the answer is complicated. And, and I think clearly we need to do a better job to explain it and have that explanation provided on our website, perhaps put a video together kind of to quickly summarize what, what uh, the facts are. And uh, I just wanted to, to add that and we can uh, talk about this in our next part about the sewer and uh, water rate uh, increase that we're going to eliminate. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Salazar. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to um, say that I, I still I, I still believe that there would be a benefit to trying to move toward a monthly bill for, for a number of reasons. And I know that it adds cost, but if we can definitely get a majority of residents to uh, sign up for an electronic uh, bill so we, we don't have to incur uh, printing and handling costs. Um, and, and honestly, I don't even, I, I couldn't tell you how to go about doing that. So if I go to the website, I don't see where I would sign up for uh, an electronic bill. So it's definitely not an easy thing. Uh, it's not obvious. Um, and so, uh, I mean, that would clearly be a first step is if we can get, as, as uh, the, the city manager mentioned, it would be a clear step. But, you know, I, um, you know, people have, um, large leaks in their house and they have to wait two months to see a large bill to figure it out. Uh, that's, you know, for a lot of people oftentimes too late. And I know that there is some forgiveness, uh, but I think it would be better not to waste the water in the first place rather than wait uh, longer to do it. I know back when we had to rely on people to physically read meters, um, it was uh, definitely cost prohibitive to have extra staff to read the meters uh, that, that often. But now that uh, the red um, remotely and electronically. Um, I think there might be some benefit to that. Uh, and, and also, you know, there might be a benefit in having the city receive payments more frequently because we have use of that money and interest on that money that we could uh, collect. And then um, if uh, accounts were to go bad, uh, we might have a heads up on that um, sooner rather than later if the, if the bills weren't coming two months ahead. So. Um, I, I, you know, I, I understand the reasons for, for why we don't do it now, but um, I, I think we could strive to move to that. And uh, not only that, I mean, getting a smaller bill m might be easier to handle for a lot of households where they're, if they're not, uh, you know, chipping away at it uh, uh, based on a, on a more predictable cycle, it, it, it's definitely harder. It's, a, it's one big bill that comes and might be more of a surprise if it's every other month rather than a monthly thing that they could plan for. So uh, that was it. Uh, definitely appreciate the information. I, I think uh, information like this is important to get out to the public. There's a lot of bad information out there and a lot of misunderstandings about how we how we operate, how we do things. And, and I think this is a, a really good uh, step in that direction in terms of providing that information to the public. So thank you. Councilmember Hamilton. Yeah, just one one quick follow up. I, I agree with um, with Council Member Salazar and, and what he said about it, it it not being clear how to sign up for paperless billing. And I just want to I just have a question about how exactly have we set up our paperless billing? I, I I can see on the bill, and I've actually used the option that there is an option to pay online, but I need to I need to go there and log in and figure out how much I owe. And um, and I've used that when I was almost late on my bill. Um, and so, but um, how how does the paperless building work? Is it sending out an email or whatever to uh, so we know how much to pay, and and then and then it's directing people to that same portal, or is it some other me uh, mechanism? Sure. Thank you, Council Member Hamilton. Uh, you can actually sign up for paperless billing on the online portal. Uh, for for uh, water and sewer services, one of the challenges is that we do not have um, half of our customers even signed up for the online portal, and so it's a it's a two pronged effort. Uh, and we, uh, uh, Chamley and Council Member Medina, uh, the answer is complicated, uh, but 
that is not sufficient and we need to be decomplicated uh, and make it simple. Uh, and this also relates to uh, another organizational improvement uh, that we're working on, which is updating our website, uh, completely changing the interface, making it more customer uh, friendly and changing how people uh, interact and find information. Unfortunately, right now our website is set up uh, in our organizational structure, and so you need to sort of more or less know where you're going to find the information. And the, the modern municipal sites really look uh, at the website through the lens of the customer uh, and take away the organizational silos. And so I know council knows that we have launched uh, that project uh, and that will bear fruit on this effort as well. And then uh, just for myself, you know, council member Davis used to talk about being going in to sign up to where you can get alerts. I will be honest, I, I do. It does come through me on the email, and everybody knows my IT background. So if I can sign up, I, it's it's easier than it, it seems once you get in um, and correct uh, to Council Member Hamilton. Um, I think there should be a way for it easier. But I also think, because I'm not signed up, to where my understanding is, is that let's say there's a the, the toilet's uh, running, which can raise your rates quickly, not even realizing if it's overnight for a long period. But I, I thought I heard that you could set it to where it, it pings you. You could also go back and look why was it elevated at this hour, um, and is that is that available? Because that I think is what folks should be able to sign up for. That uh, also would be a value. Yes, Mayor. Through that portal, you can see your your usage at any given moment. Uh, that is due to uh, for residential customers. Uh, we have uh, the uh, automatic meter readers uh, on there, and we do have a project to install those for our commercial customers as well. Okay, thank you. Well, again, thank you for the presentation and feedback. Uh, with that, we're going to move on, and again, as I talked about moving an item, so we're going to go to uh, item six, conduct of business, item B, city clerk. Item 6B, adopt a resolution canceling the previously approved water and wastewater rate increase for fiscal year 2021-22. Thank you. Director Tan. Sorry about that. Little technical difficulties there. Um, good afternoon. Uh, actually, good evening, uh, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council. Uh, Jimmy Tan, Public Works Director. I have a brief presentation on this topic tonight. Uh, the objective of the item in front of you tonight is to adopt resolution canceling the previously approved water and wastewater rate increase for fiscal year 2021 to 2022. And this item is being brought tonight uh, because staff was directed by city council during the January 12th meeting uh, to evaluate whether the water and wastewater rates can be canceled for the fiscal year 21. Uh, 2021 uh, 22. The agenda is as follows. Uh, I'll provide a brief background on the water and wastewater rates and the factors for the rate increase. Then I'll discuss the capital improvement program and project status. I'll talk about the water and wastewater funds and the utilities rates comparison. And I'll go over the alternatives and then lastly, the uh, staff's uh, recommendations. So back in 2016, uh, the city council awarded a contract to Board of Wells Associates to evaluate the city's water and wastewater rates. The rate evaluation was to ensure that there is necessary revenue to cover the projected operations and maintenance costs for the city's water and wastewater utilities and, continu and continuation of the ongoing program for investment in improving and replacing the city's aging and deteriorating water and wastewater infrastructure. So the rate study was completed in 2017 and it included adjustments of rates for five years, starting from, from fiscal year 17, 18, uh, to uh, fiscal year uh, 21 22. So, through the discussions with the City Council Utilities uh, Subcommittee, the rates were limited to 5% per year increase for both water and wastewater uh, rates. So, what are some of the factors for the water and wastewater rates increase? Well, the rate inc uh, included you know, projected increases in costs for the purchased water from San Francisco Public Utilities Commission to pay for their. Uh, upgrades to their infrastructure as part of their seismic improvement program. Uh, the existing sewer costs uh, includes ongoing treatment costs for their jointly owned South San Francisco Seminole Water Quality Control Plant 
And there's also costs for complying with the San Francisco Baykeeper and Regional Quality Board uh, settlement agreements. While these factors um, and other operating costs are important in determining rates, uh, the most significant factor impacting both water and wastewater rates is the replacement of our aging infrastructure. Uh, the average uh, age of the infrastructure for both systems is over 60 years, 60 years old. Uh, some of the sections in the city have pipelines over 100 years old. Because of the need to replace the, uh, the infrastructure and address the certain capacity deficiency, the city has an aggressive uh, capital improvement program to replace the, um, uh, the both water and sewer system over the next uh, two decades. So the water master plan uh, was completed in 2012 and it provided improvements uh, recommendations for the water distribution based on age, condition, and capacity. And all of those recommended improvements totaled $240.3 million approximately. And then the, uh, the sewer master plan was completed in 2014 and the staff has been prioritizing the work plan to complete the water, to complete the wastewater uh, pipeline capacity and pump stations improvement projects. And those uh, projects, um, improvements, the recommended improvements in the sewer master plan is approximately $133.5 million. So in order to assess the rates required for the, uh, the fiscal years 2017 to 2018 uh, through the 21-22 um, you know, cycle, uh, the, the rate study included several projects from both the water and wastewater um, uh, master plans. So these are some of the water projects uh, that were identified to be completed within the five-year period as part of the rate study. Uh, the projects were recommended uh, improvements uh, from the water master plan. So it, you know, how have we uh, performed with the list of projects that we proposed to complete within the five years? So as you can see, majority of the projects uh, have either, either been completed or has commenced uh, design. Uh, five projects have already been completed. Uh, four projects have already started the design phase. And one project is currently under construction and uh, one has yet to start. And here's the list of uh, wastewater projects that were identified to be completed within the five year period. Uh, similar to the water projects, the majority of the projects have been completed and, or has uh, commenced the design. Uh, construction of eight projects have been completed one is under construction, uh, three projects have commenced design, and as previously mentioned, the most significant factor for raising the water and wastewater rates is due to this, uh, the much needed improvements of our aging infrastructure. So as you can see from the list of projects within the last five years, we have completed many water and wastewater projects and that have utilized the money collected through these rates and to rebuild our infrastructure to last another 100 years. So during the council meeting on January you know, uh, 12th, the council directed staff to evaluate whether the water and wastewater rates can be postponed for fiscal year 21-22. Staff reviewed the fund balances and the uh, projected water and wastewater fund balances through the end of next fiscal year, assuming no rate increases. The fund balances uh, uh, shows healthy reserved um, above the reserve targets for both funds and the city can pursue canceling a rate increase for fiscal year 21-22 without jeopardizing a CAFTA project of funding. So the fund, here's a table that shows the information on the fund balances, um, reserve targets and the balance above the reserve targets. The total shown for the projected ending fund balance, which includes revenues, total operating expenses, and expenses for capital imp improvement program projects at the end of fiscal year 21-22, projected that the water fund would have a balance of $13.4 million and a wastewater of $17.1 million. The reserve target is shown to be about $7.1 for water, $7.2 million for water and $7.5 million for wastewater. And the reserve targets includes, you know, these emergency capital reserve um, and budget for operating and debt services and a reserve are needed to operate the water sewer enterprise for operating emergency on person cost. So the projected ending balance uh, for fiscal year 21-22 shows a healthy balance for both water and wastewater fund. And even with the reduction in the reserves target, there is still a balance above the, um, the reserve target that's shown there uh, on this slide. So should the rates remain the same, you know, staff um, requested assistance from a rate a consultant to determine the rates in comparison with other agencies. And this graph is similar to what you just saw from the city manager's uh, presentation earlier. Um, the, uh, the water rates, you know, includes the fixed as well as the, uh, you know, water consumption charges. 
uh, the fixed charge you know helps um, covers a portion of the city's uh, fixed costs, uh, which includes you know administration, uh, debt service, um, system maintenance, um, and equipment. However, you know fixed costs you know only covers a relatively small portion of the fixed expense. So water quantity charges are billed on a metered water use uh, basis as well. And this chart shows that the city's water rates are in the middle range in comparison to other regional agencies. Um, and San Bruno's water rate is equivalent to the average uh, for all comparable agencies and only about you know, $6.88 higher than the median. Here's a similar slide that you saw uh, from the city manager's off, uh, uh, presentation earlier as well for the sewer rates comparison. Um, and similar to the sewer, uh, similar to water, the sewer rates have both the fixed and usage uh, charges as well. Um, and this chart shows that the city's uh, sewer rates are in the middle range in comparison to other uh, regional agencies. Um, and the San Bruno sewer rate is equivalent to the average um, as well. And it's all comparable, average for all comparable uh, agency and only $3 higher than the median. And this slide shows a comparison of rates for a combined monthly water and sewer bill for a single family residence. Uh, the average rate uh, among um, all the agencies is approximately $182.35, whereas the median is $166.61. And then as shown, the San Bruno's um, uh, combined uh, bill is equivalent to the average for all comparable agencies uh, as well, and only about $15 higher than the median. So as for the alternatives, there are two. Um, do not cancel the previously approved rate increase for water and wastewater for fiscal year 21-22, or defer the fiscal year 21-22 rate increase uh, until fiscal year 22-23. But a rate study will commence in uh, late 21, uh, late uh, 2021 to look at the rates and the reserve for the next um, five years uh, beyond 21-22. So with healthy, fund balances through fiscal year 21-22, staff is recommending to adopt the resolution canceling the previously approved water and wastewater rates increase for fiscal year 21-22. Uh, so this concludes my presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions. And uh, we do have our consultants uh, available to answer any questions as well. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the report, Director Tan. And as a reminder, as the director said, this was at our January 12th meeting. Uh, that when we had a, uh, um, staff brought us a document, one of the alternatives that they recommended we could defer um, or what have you to the 21-22 uh, water sewer. Um, as I spoke and then every council member subsequent to me spoke, we gave direction, a little bit for us to get that resolution done, but then we also gave uh, direction to staff to bring this uh, back to us based on one of the alternatives that they had offered um, that I believe we all were uh, in consensus for it to come back. So with that, to my colleagues, um, questions, comments, or I should guess to say questions why we have everybody here. Ah, there we go. Just waiting for someone. Thank you for breaking the ice. Uh, Councilmember Mason. Hey, thank you. Um, thanks, Director Tan. I, I was um, I had asked in the last um, run of questions just how how long the increases have been um, going on, and uh, and I can't remember if this next year would be the last year. Uh, so if we cancel this year, would 2022 be the last year of the last five year increases? That's correct. The uh, the last year of the uh, the five year is the fiscal year 21-22. Okay, and then how, how long have we been having increases in San Bruno? Um, this was a five years rate increase. Uh, previous to that, there was another rate increase uh, started in 20, uh, 2012. And then um, I saw an article that also talked about a rate increase in 2009. Is, is that, do you know if that's right? Maybe the city manager or Alex Henners will be able to answer that. I wasn't um, here during that time, so won't be able to answer that. Sure. This is Alex Handlers. I was the, uh, you know, the financial consultant that worked for the city in the last two rate studies, water and sewer. And the city's done a good job. This is going back. I mean, the rate increases that the city's been doing has been more of an ongoing, lower, gradual rate increases year after year. 
So at least, I mean, I don't have the history going back, but I see rate increases going back at least until 2008-9 for some data that I'm looking at. But that's kind of been the philosophy of the city and a lot of agencies out there is rather than try to do no rate increases for a few years and have a big rate spike, kind of the slow, gradual increase to keep rates in line with the cost of service. And the city's done a good job with that. So um, it's put you in a position now where, because of these rate increases, you can afford to, you know, defer or cancel the next rate increase and then kind of reevaluate for the future. And um, Mr. Mr. Handler, how, um, so when cities do these uh, um, increases, is there a, a point in time where you say these, this, this is good for another hundred years, we don't, we no longer would recommend these increases? I mean, at what point um, to, is that recommended? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I'll be honest, from my side, I've been in the field for about 20 years. I've worked for more than 150 agencies. And I honestly, uh, the rate increases can stop when the costs stop increasing. And as uh, Jimmy mentioned, you've got, you know, increasing wholesale water rates. They're projected to keep on increase, increasing over the next decade. You've got, you know, increasing costs for whether it's insurance, electricity, everything like that. So the goal is, I think, more management, you know, to try to keep the rates just gradually moving uh, in line with the cost of service. And I think that's been kind of the goal of the city. There has been more of a ramp up over the last five to 10 years to increase funding for the, uh, the capital improvements and addressing the needs of aging infrastructure. It's not just San Bruno. It's, this is pretty much every city on the peninsula who's been dealing with this in, in recent times. So. The hope is once you get your rates up to kind of the, you know, probably not that much different from where they are now, um, where they're kind of funding the ongoing cost of service and capital needs, that it's, you know, really just inflationary rate increases needed going forward. And if you think about it, your your rate increases over the last few years have, you know, been 5%. For water and sewer, that's not a, ho a lot higher than what inflation is for, for most water and sewer agencies. So um, I don't know if there ever is an end, but the goal is you, you look long, you know, every five years or so, you kind of look long term and uh, reset course with gradual increases. And it's, it's more long term rate management from my perspective. And sorry for the long winded answer. Yeah, no, it's, it's OK. Um, it, at some point, though, does it become less about replacement and more about maintenance? So maybe instead of a 5% increase, you see a 2% increase. Yes, I think you're correct about that because the city right now has been engaging in kind of a, you know, a, a system replacement and upgrade um, just through the age of the system. Uh, a lot of pipelines, as Jimmy mentioned, you know, 100 years old, 80 years old. So after that process is done, you're going to have a lot of pipelines that are built with new materials that probably have lifespans of, you know, you know, 100 years or so. I'm, I'm just, I'm not an engineer, but I'm just guessing. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it'll be more, you know, the replacement needs will go away and it'll be more, um, you know, maintenance and stuff. And I think the level of increases will be less in the future after this program is complete. And doing this program, you're also, um, I think, reducing your maintenance costs because with a lot of old facilities, there's more leaks, there's more problems, emergency repairs. And as the system is replaced and the highest priority needs are taken care of, you know, it helps keep the maintenance costs down. So I think the city is doing a good job trying to proactively address these needs. And then the rates are kind of the financial stewardship that, that supports that. Okay, thank you. Um, and Alex, I'm not sure if it was you, but I did see the, um, the last meeting, I want to say in 2017 when uh, I believe it was your firm that gave the report. So this seems like it's in line with the report given back then in the recommendation. Um, I also wanted to thank uh, Director Tan because I've been asking for updates on the plans. You know, we, we do pay as a city a significant amount of money for the plans that, um, that we need and they give us our recommendations. And so in particular, slides seven and eight, I think really show that about 85% of the recommendations have been completed within the five years. Um, and I think that as a council member, as a newer council member, um, it is really nice to see the progress um, because we hear a lot from the public, where's our money going? And this is something that's not visual, you can't see it. 
Um, and it's really important that we see that our money is actually being spent on plans that we're putting into action. So um, thank you, Director Tan, for doing that for me and, um, and for the whole council. Thank you. Vice Mayor Medina. Um, <clears throat> wow. This is, um, this is the right time to take, to take a pause in, in raising our water and our sewer rates. Um, so um, I'm definitely in favor of that. I wanted to answer a question that was asked earlier. There were five years of approximately 10% rate increases in water and sewer. Um, the need to spend that type of money was driven by a long term of um, a deferred maintenance and a lawsuit that, that pretty much told the city from Baykeeper, you need to start doing this. And in order to do that, you need the money. In order to get the money, you need to rate, raise your rates. Um, with that deferred maintenance, it, um, San Bruno is an old city and a lot of their pipes, they're, they're, they're worn out, they're leaking. Um, when I worked here, um, I know our water department was out repeatedly fixing leaks just down a street over and over and over again. And that's what happens when you have old pipes. So we were legally required to, 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 to catch up and to raise the money to fix the problems that we have. They're not going to go away. Um, things have a certain lifespan. And we're looking at, and we have implemented um, using PVC pipe, which lasts longer than cast iron pipe, or um, ductile iron pipe. Um, so um, inflation is going to be with us, and, and costs will continue to go up. But we have the data that shows that we don't need this increase right now. Um, and it was the right time to do it. And it coincidentally, we have another need in our stormwater, which is pretty much going to balance out the cost of the amount of money that we would be paying for in our increase for water and sewer. We can, as ratepayers, put that money into fixing our stormwater system that over again, once again, it's, it's deferred maintenance. So we weren't taking care of the system uh, as a city. It's, it's like if, if you have a car and, and if you don't maintain your car, at one point it's going to start breaking down and you need to buy a new car. And, and that's pretty much what we had to do with our, our, our water and sewer systems, and now we're seeing our stormwater system. So, as I said earlier, the, the, the answers to our water rate history increases is complicated. Remember, um, I, was, I was on the last rate study and we were able to reduce the increase from 10% um, down to 5% by the usage of bonds as well so that we could spread those costs over time. So that's really important to remember. And it's nice to, to see that um, we're able to take a pause and, and we will reevaluate our rates based on our growth that will be coming uh, in the future. And that's in, uh, as, as we learned today in 2021 late. So um, thank you for, thank you for um, this report. Um, it, it will be interesting still to come. Um, as we continue to continue to do more <clears throat> work and we have one item that, um, in consent that I'd like to talk about. So I'll wait for, until then to, to talk more about it. So thank you. Are there are questions or comments from council. No, uh, everybody moved. Oh, uh, council member Salazar. Um, I was just going to say that I'm still in favor of, um, deferring this uh, this increase um, definitely appreciate uh, staff's 
analysis into this and confirming that it is something that we that we can do comfortably. I, I know our finances are still fragile, and so I definitely don't want to jump into making a, a decision that would have uh, ripple effects or any kind of negative consequences. And so it, it, it is reassuring, and I know that we've been dealing with increases for a long time. The, the prices have increased dramatically over the past decade. And, um, it, it is good to, again, share with the public why those rates have gone up and where that money is going. Uh, it's good to know that we are making some progress on those things. And, um, um, you know, just uh, I just want to leave it at that, that, uh, you, you know, I, I realize that we're going to have to study this again. And depending on where we are and what's still left to be done and uh, the, the, the bonds that uh, the vice mayor mentioned uh, still need to be paid. We'll be paying on those for a while. And so, um, you know, um, I, I'm hoping this doesn't set us too far back. Uh, one of the reasons for the rates increasing so quickly was that we did, uh, we, the city allowed itself to fall into sort of a, a really deep hole of uh, you know, uh, deferred maintenance that uh, was very expensive. And it, it took a lot to get us out of there we're really on a good track right now, and I want to make sure that we uh, don't do anything to derail that progress. So those are my comments. Okay, I see uh, uh, Councilman Hamilton, you haven't had an opportunity, so uh, please go ahead. So uh, I'm absolutely in favor of, of pausing the increases. And um, one uh, suggestion that I may have is, um, you know, obviously, you know, we, we, you know, we hear from the public and, and uh, you know, not everybody knows where this money is going, and I echo council member uh, Mason's comment about, you know, it's wonderful to see, you know, we put in, we put the plan in place, we're completing all of these projects, but the public largely doesn't know that this is happening. And I think we, we, sh we should try to address that. And I don't, I don't want to go spend a bunch of money in order to do that, but, you know, just through, through social media, those types of, those types of channels to, you know, to, Get the get the word out when these projects are completed because you know a few of the projects I got a preview of of the presentation uh, a couple of weeks ago um, during my onboarding with Director Tan. A few of these projects, as I understand, came in significantly under budget. This huge win, and you know that that's able to to um, contribute to the to our ability to be able to forego this 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 last um, scheduled increase. And those are that's information that the public needs to know. Um, in, in, in order to understand where their money is going. So um, I would I would recommend that we, you know, try to, to spend just a little bit of effort um, to, um, to, you know, report out, you know, via social media and other channels when we, when we complete these projects and have these wins. Okay, and, I, and, and uh, one, one thing I will say is uh, people, Business, especially on San Mateo Avenue, they un they appreciate the depth of what was being replaced and done because they would come to work and they would see it daily. But at the same time, what I would get from folks is, God, that street really looks great. It's been paved. But everything underneath that's brand new, that's really assisted, as, as Vice Mayor said, it was the regional board that initiated a lot of that because of the SSOs. Baykeepers joined them because they follow agencies around to get special little projects for other things. Um, but but yes, I think, as one of our callers said, what is the money really going for? I don't see it. Um, but once it's all done, it gets paved, uh, you have a nice street on top, but really no one has the gravity of what really has transpired down below. So anyway, uh, but uh, yes. And uh, Councilwoman Mason, then we're going to go to our city manager. Oh, just quickly, I don't think I said it. I, of course, support the cancellation of the fees. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Wow, it just looks like we haven't even taken a vote yet. I don't even know if we need to. But city manager. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just wanted to amplify a, a few points that council members made and, and connect them to data that was in Director Tan's presentation. Uh, so absolutely, the city council asked us to look into this matter as we were talking about a stormwater, uh, a potential stormwater uh, 218 process and the increase in stormwater is roughly equivalent to what the total combined savings would be for delaying or canceling uh, these rate increases. And so that, that is why this item uh, is for you tonight. Uh, in addition, uh, connecting to what uh, Councilmember Salazar said, absolutely, we looked at 
the enterprise and where we sit now in our capital improvement program, the analysis is that we will not be hurting our financial solvency in these two enterprises to delay the rate increase the, uh, or cancel the rate increase. That does not mean that subsequent rate increases will not be needed when we do our subsequent studies. One of the things we know is that as we deplete that accumulated balance in the, in, in the fund balance with those capital improvement projects, we will actually approach and potentially even come under those reserve targets now. We have uh, in some of those funds more than $10 million over the reserve target accumulated because we have saved money for capital improvement projects that are active in design and, and uh, to start soon. And so that money is allocated, but we will spend it down. But when we take a snapshot today of the enterprise, we can cancel the rate increases absolutely and not hurt the enterprise. And so I just wanted to uh, amplify that point. Um, thank you for that clarification. I think that's important too. And we do uh, the required by law that Prop 218 and it goes out and rates are increased or the voters uh, make decisions. Uh, the council, it can go up to but may not exceed. But it also gives the council the ability to review and lessen, or in this case, defer or suspend. And it gives us that latitude to do so. The important thing for me is that um, we are not going to hurt the capital or uh, the, the funds that we have in the enterprise. And that to me is what is, is most critical. Good thing is, is that uh, it comes when we have, are having some challenging times, everybody is. So um, I think we're all um, feeling that is a good thing. And, and again, uh, Director Tan was indicated earlier by Councilor Mason, kudos to you and kudos to your department and the work that you've done. Councilmember Hamilton said, having things come under budget needs to be applauded. Uh, having the work that's been done, having a plan that's been there for five years and it has systematically been having progress and you've been achieving that, that work uh, product uh, is uh, appreciated and thank you to you and your team. With that, uh, colleagues, I'm not sure who might want to, but is Mr. This Mayor. Oh, oh, geez, Vice Mayor Medina. Well, quick yeah, on the I'd, like to make, I'd like to make a motion to adopt the resolution canceling the water and sewer rate increases for fiscal year 21-22. I'll second. Uh, uh, Medina Salazar, uh, motion second, roll call city clerk. Uh, did, I'm sorry, did, did, were there, was there public comment on this? Oh, you know what? No, there has not been. I, I, maybe somebody doesn't like what we're doing. Is there a, thank you though, council member <laughs> Hamilton. Never know. I, I've been checking continuously as we've been speaking. There has been none thus far, still seeing no hands. We're going to go back to the roll call for the motion. Uh, the motion in the second. Councilmember Hamilton. Aye. Councilmember Mason. Aye. Councilmember Salazar. Aye. Vice Mayor Marty Medina. Aye. And Mayor Rico Medina. Aye. Motion okay. carries. Thank you, Councilman Hamilton. Just as a reminder, never know. My my eyes could be on a different panel. Okay. With that, we are going to move um, back to consent. Right. So item five. Uh, consent calendar. All items are considered routine or implement an earlier council action and may be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion unless um, unless requested. So for myself, um, we're going to need on item G, I'm going to need to um, read a statement and then um, before we open it up, um, to the public. So right now, are there other items that are to be removed for a separate vote? And then I'm going to ask for items that just need some commentary or wanting community. Um, first, anything to be removed for a separate vote? Separate vote. I'm seeing no head. Thank you, uh, Vice Mayor. Councilman, okay, good. Everybody's doing no. Is there any items for um, for further, you know, dialogue or a question. Vice Mayor. Um, item E, please. Mm, e is an Edward. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Council Member Hamilton. Uh, item D, just a very minor correction for the minutes. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Mason. I think same D as in dog and E as in Edward, so I'm good. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Okay, 
So um, I'm going to take them in order, if that is okay, folks, just so we keep on the system. So let's go to first on consent item D. Item D is approve the regular minute meetings for the special and regular minutes of January 4th, 26th, and 29th, 2021. Councilmember Hamilton. So just a minor correction on item 6B, uh, where we adopted the resolution for the um, fire apparatus. Um, it shows that I made a that I made the motion, but it doesn't show that anybody seconded it. So just need to add that in. That would that would be important because the fire chief would probably be very disappointed if all of a sudden nothing was ordered, huh? Got to make sure that we get those trucks. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes, I will. Thank you. I'll add that in. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Councilmember Mason. Yeah. So, um, Councilmember Hamilton's was one, and then I also um, wanted to ask that. Um, this is more of a, a general consideration, but in this one, because uh, the arena was such a lively topic. Um, to include the, for those residents who offered where they live, to include the city of residence in the minutes. Um, and then for, and this was for the minutes of January 26, 2021. And then the other area that I had a comment on was to change the area around the city net services. The language right now, um, hold on, I actually had this. So the language right now just reads that the city manager had expressed that the city net services, um, that there were no city net service related expenses in the foreseeable future. Uh, and I'd like to add um, that it didn't mean that they could not be increased as the year progressed and the networks negotiated their rates with the city, which is what the city manager said during the meeting. Um, so I just think it needs to reflect the entire statement that the city manager made. Yeah, not, not knowing that I haven't gone back to look because I had no idea. And so uh, city manager may remember. I don't remember it verbatim, but you probably have gone back and checked. But Vice Mayor Medina, your hand is up, sir. Sorry, that was um, for item um, E. Okay. Gotcha. Um, okay. So um, is everybody clear on, on that? Staff, we're good? Okay. So let's move on to item E. Adopt resolution explaining the avenues 1-1 and 1-2 sewer and water main replacement project as complete, authorizing the filing of the notice of completion with the San Mateo County Recorder's Office and authorizing release of the construction contract retention in the amount of 327416 And we're going to go to Council Member Medina. I mean, I'm sorry, Vice Mayor Medina. Apologies. Yes, thank you, Mayor Medina. It gets a little confusing to understand. <laughs> Um, well, tonight's a perfect, perfect example. You know, here we have an item, it's on consent. Um, we had a project of eight point, almost $8.6 million that got done for uh, $7.2 million. How often does a government project get done under budget by 15.8%? It takes a lot of work, it takes, uh, um, and, and, and I, I, I would like to thank staff and, and, and this is an example of how water and sewer services to a portion of our community, they're absolutely brand new. And not only that, there are curb ramps installed. There are, there is new pavement. Florida Avenue was one of the worst streets in San Bruno and now it's a newly paved street with, with the invisible water and sewer system underneath, right? Seven, $7.2 million, right? So um, it's, it's messy when you're, when you're replacing an existing water and sewer system. When you're putting in a brand new water sewer system in a brand new development, it's really easy. There's nothing in the way. So uh, wonderful job staff. Um, in the future, um, I, I would I would ask that updates on the construction activity be provided. Um, what happens is typically the, the the sewer gets installed and then the workers leave and the residents don't really know like okay they left and but they didn't fix the street and then months 
later, the crews come back again and rip up the street. They put it in the water. And the street's not all paved. And then finally, everything gets done. So if we can get an update on the remaining um, construction projects that are occurring, the active construction projects that are occurring um, with uh, status and completion dates, estimated completion dates, I think that would be helpful for people to understand and to really appreciate that that this is what it's going to take to replace water and sewer in an old city. So thank you, staff, for a job well done. Thank you. Councilmember Mason. Yeah, I, I'm echoing um, Councilmember Medina's comments. I highlighted here a cost savings of $1,361,376, and that just brings a big smile to my face because we are in such a uh, precarious situation right now with our finances. Um, and so according to the staff report, $715,345 will be returned to the Wastewater Enterprise Fund and $646,031 to the Water Capital Fund. So just a, a huge thank you. And I hope that these savings do come to the uh, council as they occur, because uh, it's just really good news to share. Thank you. Thank you. And the news will come because it is required and there are contract changes, uh, which we put in some time ago. But yes, when we close them out, they do come back to council as they had not in the past. Um, and to the public, I will go to the last item and then I'll open it up for the public just so we have at least covered all the items. Okay, item G, uh, adopt resolution approving amend, uh, amendment one to the employment agreement between the city of San Bruno and Javodi Grogan, city manager. This is... Uh, if, if those remember um, when the Bell, City of Bell, did their things, there are some uh, changes to the law. So I'm going to read uh, from the follow following that is a requirement. And this is what I will be reading. So understand that's why I'm looking down so I get every word correct. Based on the agreement with the city manager, pay adjustments are reviewed annually and are dependent on various performance factors. Council met multiple times in closed session with the city manager and determined that the amendment agreement is fair and equitable based on performance and labor market uh, comparison. The contract amendment provides for the same buyout options for management and vacation leave as department heads. The amendment also brings the city manager from 12% below the median of comparable cities with the, with the count, San Mateo County, sorry, based on the 2021 survey for the salary increase of 6%, 258,203. Effective the first pay period of January 2021, the city manager remains a 6% below uh, peers uh, to, uh, within the county. So that's uh, something, I know it's wordy, but uh, needs to be read. But at this time, uh, before I open it up to the public, I want to turn to our uh, city manager and uh, who has follow-up to this item and a comment, sir. Sure. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, City Council, uh, and to members of the public. So I asked the Mayor uh, to speak on this item uh, because I wanted to share uh, a few uh, uh, words. And I know that this is uh, typically not, uh, that this is not typical, so I want to thank the Mayor for allowing me to do this. Uh, first, I, I really want to thank the City Council um, uh, for the conversations we had uh, recognizing uh, where my compensation sits uh, in comparison uh, to the uh, peer, my peer city managers in the county uh, and, and taking the, the, the bold action to um, uh, offer an increase, uh, knowing that where we are financially, uh, I can't be, be brought on par. Uh, so I really want to thank you for that uh, and, and that political courage. Um, I also want to say that uh, everybody that knows me knows that I don't do this job uh, for the compensation. I am deeply committed to what we're doing here in San Bruno. I am deeply committed uh, to every last member uh, of the city team. Uh, and I, I am so proud of the work that we have done. Um, and, you know, frankly, given where we are um, financially as an organization uh, and given the financial challenges that continue uh, to confront us with COVID-19, uh, I do want to proffer a, a change here should the city council uh, be amenable. Uh, and I want to uh, take the action to sort of unilaterally uh, postpone uh, the salary increase a full year. Uh, so instead of taking uh, effect January uh, 1, 2021, uh, 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 push that out of a full year to uh, the first pay period in January of 2022. 
uh, no retro, um, no um, uh, no back pay, uh, just a full uh, pushing out uh, of that salary plan section of the amendment. Uh, and so I want to thank you uh, and to all, all members of the team. Uh, we say it internally, one city, one team, uh, and we're all in this together. Thank you, thank you city manager. Um, and uh, I'll have to check with the attorney, but my understanding is that council, if wishing to accept that from the uh, city manager, can make that uh, modification. We do not need to separately pull it and vote for it. You correct me. But as long as we give direction that that can be modified, we don't need to have it come back with a new resolution. Is that correct? That's correct, Mr. Mayor. Um, the city council approves the uh, request to extend the salary portion of the amendment for a year uh, will reflect that in the amendment to the contract when uh, before it's finalized and signed okay thank you um at this time i'd like to open it to the public and obviously it can be on any item on consent since we've gone through a lot so city clerk if you would uh, yes we have paul wapensky Good evening. I'd like to talk about the uh, city manager raise. Um, the medium income in San Bruno is $133,479. Uh, lots of people are out of work. We just cut $8 million from the budget. We raised the sales tax. I'm sure Recology is going to come for more money soon. Yet the council is going to approve a 6% increase uh, in the uh, city manager's salary. That's $84,000 more than our congresswoman makes and 21,000 more than the Vice President of the United States as a perspective. Every council meeting talks about how bad our finances are. And, um, you know, he, he just came out and he said he doesn't work for the money. Um, then maybe we should spend that money on people who need it. You know, I don't, I don't regudge, regudge him any, uh, uh, you know, not making a good salary. And he seems to do a good job for the city. He's on top of what's going on. But I asked this, the five uh, members of the council, how can you possibly justify a 6% pay raise to someone making almost double the median income in a time when so many people are either don't have employment or not getting a salary uh, and not getting salary increases at all? Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Uh, yes, the next speaker is uh, Shabina Hussein. I'm trying to unmute you. Shabina, I'm unable to unmute you on my end. Are you able to unmute yourself? Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't rec realize what I did. I didn't mean to like say anything. Sorry. Oh, okay, no problem. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Stephen Seymour. Okay. Sandra Perez Vargas here. Um, I wanted to commend the city manager for foregoing that raise. I mean, the words on the street were like, how, how could this even be a consideration at a time like this when, um, we're just financially doing so bad. Our city is visibly deteriorating. We see the litter every day. Not to mention, I mean, th this is what I'm being told. People who will not be receiving salary increases will be the local 856 employees and local 350 mid-management employees. Also, the uh, rec department is running with just two coordinator coordinators. Uh, there's a hiring freeze for the rec supervisor and senior center coordinator in the parks department i've been told that three employees retired early so three others would not be laid off seven parks of uh, workers for 14 parks 12 baseball fields and two football fields that's um that's a lot of work and and i'm not sure if this is correct but i my understanding is that in july 20th during a hiring freeze that an assistant was hired for the city manager. Um, so I, I think it's, um, we really look, need to look uh, where our money is going and to spend it as wisely and as fairly as possible. Um, there, there's a lot of people out there suffering and there will definitely be um, a lot of really bad feelings if this uh, raise were to take place. 
Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next speaker, please. The next speaker will be Trish, Teamsters 856. Just one moment while I bring you in. Hi, council members. Thank you. Whenever you're ready. Okay. Hi, council members. Thank you for taking the time to listen to me. I'm Trish with Teamsters 856. Um, and I'm just uh, calling to reiterate my comments that I sent in earlier and asking that um, before these raises go through that we do take a look at your city workers who we represent every city worker in the city of San Bruno have done a lot to sacrifice their own wage freezes uh, increase froze their wage increases they've work to help keep the city open and thriving throughout this pandemic to provide to the residents so that they're not forgotten during through this pandemic and that we make sure that when the economy is better that we also restore our our members and these workers who have worked so diligently through this and put their own health and safe that safety at risk before we give increases to the city manager thank you very much for your comments next speaker please the next speaker is Jeffrey Tong. Hi, this is Jeffrey Tong speaking. Again, I'm one of the others uh, that want to um, uh, want to thank the city manager for foregoing his uh, increase this year. For two hundred and fifty-eight thousand, six percent is about fifteen thousand dollars enough to support one starving person who's unemployed. With so much trash in the city, I've been asking city council, let's look at the possibility of maybe hiring some homeless people to help clean up the streets and maybe even help them with housing, or whatever it might be. But as they say with adopting a dog or something you may not change the whole world by adopting a dog but you change the whole world for that one dog and so i'm not comparing people with dogs but ne nevertheless you can change one person's life with that one salary increase so thank you um jovan grogan for uh forestalling your increase in salary thank you bye-bye Thank you for your comments. Being no other public comment on consent, I'm going to bring it back to council. Again, everything could be taken in one action, and if we wish to concur with the manager's uh, request, uh, that can be done simply um, by modifying that uh, as we take full action. So, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Councilmember Mason. Yeah, I just made a comment. I had just. Um... Uh, written um, and I just actually added a little something based on um, city manager Grogan's comment but I just wanted to thank uh, Trish for her public comment on behalf of the San Bruno team that represents Teamsters local 350 and local 856 and the others who called in for public comment uh, I think it's important to highlight some of the movement that San Bruno has really seen in this past year I'm focusing on this past year because I've seen it myself um, in revenue generation under the leadership of our city manager um, when combined and implemented, these are all on their way to place San Bruno in a better position than where we are and where we have been. Um, so in, re in 2020, we as a city entered into the Walmart participation agreement that's going to provide approximately $3 million to the city of San Bruno on an annual basis. Uh, the transit and occupancy tax, also known as TOT, um, went on the ballot and was approved by the voters. Uh, the cannabis tax was placed on the ballot, was also approved by the voters. Um, there's also been a creation and adoption of the short-term rental ordinance that is approved, that was approved in 2020 and currently underway. Um, amongst these very impactful decisions in 2020, we're also moved and directed the staff to continue to negotiate the Bay Hill Plan, which is, a, um, Bay, which is supposed to bring in approximately $60 million in fees to the city of San Bruno. Uh, we also saw the use of the Measure K funds actually being implemented um, with the plans, the designs, the procurement all done by the city under the city manager's leadership um, to um, actually improve the bleachers and the Tom Lara fields along with the Lions Club. So um, tonight we just heard the item around the cancellation of the water and sewer rate hikes. 
The last meeting, we agreed to consider foregoing any city net cable internet rate increases and agreed to have staff make a request to Recology to forego an increase in 2021. This is all being done to assist not those who can afford to pay these impacts, but those who are really living on the margins. Uh, we also did not provide increases to local 350 and local 856. So it only makes sense that the city manager would also forego his increase in 2021. Uh, finally, I just really want to thank city manager Grogan. Um, this was not expected uh, for making something that seemed really so unattainable for seven years. Um, more beautiful by such a simple fix. And this is really these moments that make our city manager so valuable um, with just um, putting grass at Florida Park. It really alleviated the blight for the entire neighborhood who has been living with that for seven years. Um, as we continue to create the foundation of financial stability and strong government governance, I look forward to seeing what the next year brings to San Bruno under your leadership, City Manager Grogan. It has been an amazing year, and I thank you for um, for everything that you've done. Thank you. Councilmember Hamilton, you did have your hand up, but then it went down. Yes. So. Uh, mostly because um, Councilmember Mason said what I wanted to say so much more eloquently than I want, than I was going to. So um, I will shorten my statement to, to commanding the City Manager for this action. Anything else from uh, the vice mayor or council member? If, if uh, uh, vice mayor Medina, I'd like to say thank you. Um, it's um, I look forward to working with our city manager, and and uh, we're getting a lot of stuff done. And uh, thank you for 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 taking this position, and and, and thank you for um, deferring an increase. Like, like all our other employees. So, thanks. Uh, Councilmember Salazar? I'll also echo uh, what's been said and uh, offer my appreciation to the city manager for, uh, for this gesture and, and for all this hard work uh, over the, the past uh, couple of years. Uh, it's, uh, we have seen a lot of, a lot of progress and, um, and, and I think this, this was uh, the right thing to do and I appreciate uh, his, uh, his, um, you know, his effort to to make things uh, to make things right and make sure that uh, that uh, that fairness and equity is uh, is is well represented. And uh, with with that, I think we've heard. Hold on. I will so let, can, can the mayor say something, and I'll throw it back to you. Okay. Just so we all have a chance. No, um, just wanted to say, uh, you know, Vice Vice Mayor Medina was, and so was I, former city employees. So, you know, at times when uh, people are, whether it was back then when we had furloughs or whatever, or when I, you know, we took a freeze so we didn't uh, have other uh, situations arise, um, it's important. Um, and we acknowledge the employees of 856 and 350 that, uh, that do the job, come to work, and have worked through all these challenging times. And also, uh, city manager, you are, uh, you know, you, you are responsible for the day-to-day -day operations. So I appreciate you uh, uh, leading by example and uh, uh, asking for this to be deferred. And yes, it is uncharacteristic for the manager to speak, but uh, uh, I appreciate our conversation and uh, I thank you for your comment. So with that, uh, Councilmember Salazar. All right, so with that, I will make a motion to approve the consent calendar with uh, the modifications to the minutes recommended by Councilmember Mason and the modification to the city manager's contract as um, uh, stated by the city manager. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion made by Sal Salazar, seconded by Mason. Uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Hamilton. Aye. Councilmember Mason. Aye. Councilmember Salazar. Aye. Vice Mayor Marty Medina. Aye. Vice Mayor Rico Medina. Aye. Okay, thank you for everyone. And we're going to move on to um, back to conduct of business. Uh, number six, item A, city. Wave first reading and introduce an ordinance of the city council of the city of San Bruno amending and readopting title six public peace, morals and welfare of the San Bruno, San Bruno municipal code and amending section 1.04.020. City attorney. 
Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. Um, if you could just give me a minute, I'll pull my PowerPoint presentation up and hopefully not encounter any technical difficulties when I'm sharing my screen. So let me uh, let me do that. Can everybody see that? Yes. Can everyone still see that? <laughs> yes. Okay, great. Thank you. You never know these days. All right. Uh, so we're here to uh, take a look at revisions to Title VI of the Municipal Code, and I just have a brief PowerPoint presentation to walk everybody through it, and then um, happy to take any questions at the end. So here's our agenda tonight. Uh, we're going to give you a little background. We're going to um, introduce and discuss amendments to Title VI, and we're going to talk about next steps. So here's the background. You've seen this slide before, but it, it never hurts to see it again, especially since there's usually a couple of months in between these presentations on the Municipal Code. So we started this back in uh, late 2018 when the City Council uh, directed uh, me to uh, comprehensively amend the code. And the primary focus then was to update it for internal consistency and uh, to comply with uh, current law. And in addition to that, to have whatever policy discussions were necessary for those uh, revisions. So we initiated um, in late that year, introduction of Title I and a uh, portion of Title II. And then in November, our code publisher, Quality Code Publishing, QCP, completed their initial review, and we've relied on them for a lot of the consistency determinations so that uh, we can make sure that the code does conform with state law, and um, we've independently reviewed it for that and plus uh, with respect to recent case law. So in November, the City Council took action to adopt amendments to Titles 1 and 2, and uh, then in uh, July, they finished up the rest of Title II and all of Title III, which was revenue and finance. In March of 2020, the City Council adopted revisions to Title IV, which was licenses and regulations. And then um, later, just a, a month later, provided policy direction regarding Title V, which was nuisances. And so um, last June, those amendments were adopted to Title V. So we're now here to talk about Title VI, which is entitled Public Peace, Morals, and Welfare. And Title VI consists of uh, 20 chapters. And the good news is we don't have to necessarily go through each one of them individually, but what I do want to do is give you a, a brief overview of the ones that we are recommending amendments to. And for those that we're not recommending amendments to, the reasons why, why not. And obviously all of those topics are open for your discussion. So uh, the first chapter is definitions, next is firearms, next is trespassing and loitering. And for those three, we are going to propose some amendments and I'm gonna cover those uh, just in a couple of slides. So we'll, we'll leave those aside for the moment. I'm gonna display a couple of uh, chapters here that we're not um, at this time recommending any amendments to. And so um, there's, there's one having to do with abuse of solicitation. So that's sort of aggressive panhandling. There's a juvenile daytime curfew that we're not at this time uh, recommending changes to, but obviously that's also subject to discussion. Same with noise regulations. We're not recommending any changes to that at, at this time. And then this real estate transfer disclosure about airport, airport noise, uh, that's, that's a result of SFO uh, being in, um, you know, near our city. So uh, those are some of the first sets of chapters. And remember, we are gonna go back and talk about the ones to which we are proposing amendments in just a minute. So to finish up the remaining uh, chapters, uh, we have assisting locked out people. Uh, that's a fairly standard one. We have regulations of adult businesses. Uh, drug paraphernalia, we'll talk about in a minute because we are proposing actually that to be repealed aerosol paint container regulations, animal control, and alcoholic beverages in public, those were not proposing any amendments to at this time. 
And then the last uh, bucket of these is uh, false alarm. There's a, a small amendment there, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute. We're not uh, proposing any amendments to the, the two fireworks chapters or the tobacco or uh, smoking uh, regulations. Um, a council member did catch one thing on the smoking regulations. We'll, we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and uh, we'll have a separate discussion about the uh, marijuana chapter 6.58 and 5.9. Um, just quickly with respect to the smoking regulations, a council member indicated that um, there was a section that delayed its implementation and that section is no longer operative because it's already been implemented. So we could certainly either leave it in or take it out. It, it doesn't really matter. Um, and then we'll talk about the, the marijuana ones uh, in just a couple of minutes. So let's so, so that's an overview of the 20 chapters. Let's focus on the five that we are recommending amendments to, and then we can always come back to some of the other ones in the discussion. So the first one is 6.04 definitions. There's a bunch of, of relatively minor changes to that. I would say the most significant change that, that you, you see is for consistency with state law having to do with um, the reference to gender. So um, we, we currently have male and female. Uh, state law requires that we also uh, refer to gender as non, uh, one possible uh, gender identification is non-binary. And so that's included in, in that and that will update the, the code. With respect to 6.08 firearms, uh, this came up last year, um, and um, it, this is to propose, I guess what I would refer to as a relatively non-controversial uh, ordinance to supplement state law having to do with safe storage of firearms. And we're gonna talk about that in a little bit more detail. Uh, trespassing and loitering, 6.12, uh, there's really just some minor changes there for consistency with state law. And also you might remember when we did Title IV, we amended um, definitions and of, of peddlers and solicitors to comply with state law then. And this conforms this particular title to those definitions as well. Uh, drug paraphernalia, we're actually recommending that be repealed because state law has in essence preempted uh, that. And we've checked with the police chief about that and um, he's, he's in agreement, we don't need that anymore. Uh, false alarms, there was a, a very minor change in state law uh, that basically says that if you're one of the um, alarm companies, you can't be charged the, the, the city's false alarm fee unless it was a problem with their equipment. So we've, we've shown that change in the, um, uh, in the uh, text. So, those are the, the five chapters that we are proposing changes to. And, and let's drill down a little bit deeper into the ones that the changes are more substantive. And primarily it's, it's firearms. So we're recommending review of a safe storage ordinance. And what is that? So the object of the ordinance is really to mitigate uh, the increased risk of injury or death from unsecured firearms in residences. And you'll notice from the staff report, uh, there's a lot of information about the fact that uh, having uh, firearms in residences that are unsecured in one way or another really does increase the risk of injury or death both to uh, to minors and to adults. And so that's the purpose of, of this ordinance. And uh, it's also been written so that it provides a bit of an incentive uh, to report unsecured firearms because it says if you're one of the people who reports them, then you can't be prosecuted for violating the, the ordinance. So drilling down even a little bit farther, there is a state law that addresses this. It's, it's in the penal code. And basically what it does is it prohibits the unsafe storage of loaded or unloaded firearms that the owner knows or has reason to know that a child or a prohibited person could access them. And a prohibited person is one of those people that, that is prohibited from owning a firearm under state law. So um, in that ordinance, if it's violated, you can be convicted either of a misdemeanor or a felony, but it does require, a violation does require that there actually be an injury or, or death for that. So the uh, municipal safe storage ordinances, I have a couple of features, one of which really is to try to fill some gaps in, in state law. So for example, it's designed to protect adults as well as children from the risk of improperly secured firearms. It doesn't just apply to, to children. 
And I've been personally involved in, for example, some weapons petition cases where the, the city, as you know, uh, does go to court on a relatively frequent basis to remove uh, weapons from homes where there's been instances of domestic violence. And so uh, those, are, those are adults usually involved in those things. And, uh, you know, it, you have a couple of those cases and it's pretty scary to, to understand what sorts of unsecured weapons are, are being uh, kept in some of these homes. Um, we've had residents who keep loaded guns under their pillow, uh, who keep firearms strewn around the house uh, in case there's a, you know, somebody comes into the house and they're sort of in different locations so they can be easily accessed by the resident. There's really a whole bunch of very scary scenarios that can occur in these things. So that's partly what the law is designed to address. And the enforcement mechanisms for, for this ordinance would be the same as for all other ordinances, either an administrative citation or a misdemeanor. Uh, similar ordinances have been adopted by a variety of cities on the peninsula. They're not all identical. They're, they're different in certain ways. Uh, some adopted them uh, earlier. Some have yet to adopt them. So we're not the first or the last. Um, but we, what I tried to do when I drafted the proposed amendments is to take what I felt was the best features of, of all of those ordinances and, and put them into ours to, to make it both simple, um, easy to understand, and easy to follow. All right, so um, let's uh, just take a, a minute and discuss the cannabis ordinances, because as I indicated in the staff report, at this time we're not proposing that we have a, a deep policy discussion um, or direction about revising those uh, for a couple of reasons. So you might remember last year, the city council did defer those so they could place the, the cannabis tax measure on the ballot. And I think you know a couple of council members have referred to that in some of their comments, and that did pass. Um, and at that time, the city council did not direct staff to develop any regulatory changes to the existing ordinances. Um, however, it was clear that the city council contemplated that they were going to review the current prohibition on cannabis activities after the ordinance um, was adopted by the voters, the tax ordinance. So really the, the question I think for tonight is uh, do we want to sort of stop and pause and take a deep dive into uh, those ordinances or what staff is recommending for a variety of reasons is simply to discuss uh, that work effort during the March or April uh, of this year com coming up in really just a, a month or, or two, the priority setting meetings. And the reason for that is that unlike uh, other ordinances, this is going to require sort of a comprehensive effort involving multiple departments. I think we've told you that that before uh, late last year when we were talking about it. And so to, to tilt up efforts from, you know, finance police, uh, obviously the city attorney's office, uh, but then also a planning and economic development really need a collaboration of all those departments. And I think quite a bit of time uh, to, to put that together. We also have, as you might recall, outside uh, consultants who have helped us or who will help us develop that ordinance and also the implementation of the ordinance because once the ordinance is adopted, uh, we wanna make sure that when somebody comes in the door and says, I'd like to open up a business that we have all of those systems in place and ready to go. And that's, so that's quite a work effort. And in talking with a staff about it, we thought it would be best to put that on the list of uh, tasks for the city council to direct staff to do if they wish during the priority setting. So uh, the next steps would be to review the proposed amendments, uh, introduce the ordinance, or if you wanna make some substantive revisions in it or provide me with additional direction, I'm happy to take that. And then we can come back and reintroduce it at the subsequent, at a subsequent meeting. And then, but if not, we would schedule adoption for the next meeting. So uh, the, the schedule does remain on track, just, just barely, <laughs> uh, to try to complete this uh, before the end of, of the year. Um, if we you know, do complete this, then we'll, we'll have through Title 11 to do. And uh, Title 11, actually, we've already done about half of it. You might remember that that was all the building and fire codes that were done last year. So there is a little less than a, a full title to do there. But uh, we are going to do our darndest to try to get that accomplished uh, this year, despite the tremendous work effort that the rest of staff is putting in on many, many other projects. 
So that concludes my report, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, and uh, I know we probably have a couple folks that have been waiting. I just want to remind uh, Council that on the 6.08, uh, which is the uh, potential safe storage of firearms, that was something that we uh, had discussed, and Council Member Hamilton, you were not on the Council at the time, that I brought up on July 28th and brought forward to Council under Council comments and asked, and there was consensus to have this brought back forward in an ordinance, but it was with staff's recommendation to wait since it included chapter six to get it all done, right? And and, and uh, collective. So there's something that was based then. So what I'd like to do at this point, if it's okay, since it's getting close to 10, to see if there's any members of the public that wish to speak on this item. And then we will obviously bring it back to council. I just want to make people able to do other things that they need to do that. So, City Clerk, if you'd call on the public. Okay, Mayor Medina, um, we have, I'm trying to bring, I'm sorry, we have Kelly Traver, but I'm having trouble bringing you in the room. I'm sorry, Mayor, you're muted. Sorry, maybe we can uh, go uh, to Mr. Selling and then we oh. can. Well, let me see if maybe if I'm just trying to get her unmuted at this point. Kelly, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can oh, there you, hear you are. Me? Okay, yes, now we can. Um, Hi, Mayor and Council members. First, I want to thank you hugely for addressing safe storage of firearms in the home. Um, as you know, one small child dies every day in this country and two teens commit gun suicide every day um, after finding an unsecured firearm in their home or a relative's home. 80% of school shootings, 80% of all school shootings occur by a student or former student of that school who obtains an unsecured firearm. This past year with COVID has seen a dramatic increase in unintentional child deaths by a shocking 43% and teen suicides with unsecured guns by 9%, um, mandating that a firearm be safely stored in a securely locked container does not prevent someone from protecting oneself in an emergency. Firearms kept in a securely stored locked container can be accessed in seconds if need be. Research also does show that safe storage can prevent the unintentional deaths of small children and teen gun suicides by up to 85%. So I thank you so much for proposing a safe storage ordinance. It's just common sense gun legislation to keep our community safe. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next speaker, please. Next speaker is John Selling. Can you hear me? Yes, whenever you're ready. Good, thank you. My name is John Selling. I'm a physician, and uh, I'd like to thank you for what sounds like uh, uh, going forward with passage of, of, of this uh, amendment. I, uh, I'm alarmed by the increase in domestic gun violence that we've seen during COVID, uh, leading to, to uh, accidental deaths in children and adults, as well as an increase in suicides. Um, as you all know, having a gun available makes it a lot easier to commit suicide, uh, whereas if more time uh, is allowed, uh, the, these types of things would not happen. So I, I thank you very much for considering this. Uh, I would love to see much more done, but uh, at least uh, uh, with safe storage of guns, I think that's a good start. And so uh, uh, hopefully this will mitigate some of these uh, useless deaths. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Our last speaker, next please. Uh, last speaker is Lisa Wideup. Just one moment while I bring you in. Hello. Hello, whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, so I just want to echo um, the comments that have already been made and say thank you for introducing this amendment. It's so important 
and urge you all to adopt it. Um, you know, just as, as a mother, just knowing that our children are safer um, if they go to play at a friend's house, um, if the, the parents uh, own firearms and it, it would be safely stored and they wouldn't be able to access it, just being one use case, but one that we see way too often. So um, that, that's really all I wanted to come here to say. So thank you so much. Thank you for your comments. Now we'll bring it back to City Council uh, for questions on uh, the um, Title VI of the ordinance, I mean of the uh, Municipal Code. To my colleagues, anything? Going once? Going, okay. Council Member Mason? Okay, so I, I have um, quite a bit. I think that um, I, if it's okay with the City Attorney, um, should I just go down the list. I know I sent an email and thank you for the response, but there is a bit that I want to make sure we touch on since we're looking at the entire, I mean, we are essentially approving the amendments, but we're also looking at the entire section. So um, just in regards to the firearms, I do have one basic procedural question is um, if it gets approved, the amendment gets approved, how will the change be communicated to those who own guns today? So that's a great question. Um, we we did not explicitly consider a communication plan. I wonder if maybe the, the police chief might have some thoughts about that. Yeah, he and I spoke about the ordinance at, at some in some detail before uh, proposing it. And uh, I don't want to put him on the spot, but I uh, wonder if he has any thoughts. And if not, we can certainly come back to the city council with that information. Why don't we, oh, yeah, the, uh, the chief just, uh, him online. I'm sorry, Please you guys are able to hear me now? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council. I think that the communication plan here would mirror uh, similar initiatives that we've done uh, or engaged in in the past when we have to communicate any kind of change in law uh, to our residents, which uh, as the city attorney has alluded to here, we have not put together that communication plan yet, <clears throat> but I think that you could count on it, including a uh, integrated plan working with uh, all the various city entities and leveraging the influence that the police department has developed through various social media channels and other uh, communication networks to kind of get the word out about this ordinance and the change that's being made to, to existing gun law. As, as the city attorney alluded to as well, <clears throat> this is largely covered by existing law um, and common sense and training that people receive when they uh, obtain their handgun safety certificates but it is a little bit of a departure in terms of some of the restrictions and, and we will take a really active role in communicating that to the community. Okay, thank you. Thank um, you, Chief. If, if we need you further, uh, we'll, we'll call on you. Go, go ahead and mute and take your camera off if you like. Thank you. Next. Great, thank you. So um, I'll just go down the, um, the list. Um, the section 6.14.010, this is on uh, page 22. And this is around the juvenile truancy. Um, there's a sentence in there that says the city council has determined that there is a high juvenile truancy rate in its schools. Um, I, this is something you're not going to know off the top of your head, but um, but I am curious to know if this is still true. If if not, I, I would recommend taking that out. Um, in this section, there's also a section on parental responsibility. And since you know these juvenile truancy rules have been put in place, there have been a number of studies around uh, the repercussions and impacts and who these you know ordinances impact more, whether it's fair or not. And in particular, the um, the parental responsibility section, um, both in 6.14.050 and 6.14.070. I would just request that they be reviewed um, because some of this is placing the, um, the fines or the fees on the parents. Um, and then can, can, they, can they afford to pay them? And how are they being impacted uh, compared to other parents um, who may also not be experiencing obviously the same difficulties um, with their children if the kids are out and about? Um, there's another penalty under 6.14.070 that says that if a juvenile has been issued a citation for violation and they fail to appear to the division of the juvenile court, 
they're automatically reported to the State Department of Motor Vehicles and then have their driver's license suspended. And so I, I, don't, I feel like um, unless, I don't know how the hearings work for the juveniles, but it just seems like one is, one is harsh. I mean, it's like you missed jury duty because you just forgot or because you didn't get the notice or, and all of a sudden your license is suspended. Um, you know, this, I think the, the juvenile should probably have more than one opportunity before they're reported to uh, the State Department of Motor Vehicles. Um, just going down the um, 6.14.080 um, cost recovery. Um, I am, I'm just curious to know if um, we have ever actually gone after anybody for the juvenile truancy, the time that's spent with the police, it looks like. Um, I don't want to read the whole thing, but just um, the gist of it is that, you know, the police may have to drive them to and from a location because they're out and about when they shouldn't be. So I'm just curious to know if this is actually, you know, active and if not, should we keep it if it, if it hasn't been used? Um, council member through the mayor, um, council member Mason, if, yep. if you'd like, we can provide a brief response to that. I know that the chief and I also did uh, discuss this particular section and he may have some thoughts about the comments that you made. Yeah, and I, and, uh, I should say that thank you for the email. I think it said that th there's been three cases, but I don't know if any of them have actually been fined the time for the spent. But go ahead, if the chief would like to respond. Yeah. No. Uh, ahead, yes, chief. I can respond briefly to that. I, I know there was an email response that, yeah, we've had uh, since 2014, three cases in which the police department has enforced a curfew violation on a juvenile. None of those three cases involved violation of the daytime curfew ordinance that's designed to help enforce truancy issues. Uh, all of those were nighttime uh, curfew violation issues. So it, it would go without saying, I think that we have uh, obviously not progressed to the point where we have imposed any kind of cost recovery on those juveniles or their families um, because we, we haven't even actually enforced the daytime ordinance uh, anytime since we went to our new record management system back in 2014. Uh, I, I wouldn't see that uh, being something that the police department would, would really engage. And I think as, as we described in the email message response, uh, the reality is that we generally leave truancy issues to the school to manage. And I think that this municipal code is, is really written in there as a tool that, that makes it clear that uh, police officers can lawfully detain juveniles who are not in school when they're supposed to be so that we can begin that process of getting them to the school and getting the school to handle uh, discipline internally as they normally do. Uh, the cases that get to the point of us referring something over to the traffic court or to the juvenile criminal system would, would involve um, you know, extenuating circumstances where we either have a real difficulty where parents are asking for help managing an issue they're having with the child uh, or we're having, um, in all three of those cases, I can tell you there were more significant criminal offenses being investigated and, and the curfew violations ended up just being part of the case that was forwarded over. So I hope that provides a little bit of clarity as to kind of the scope we're dealing with in San Bruno and, and how we manage it at the police department. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Um, so then, uh, so I understand if we want to keep it as a tool just to have it, but I do think that we should take a look at a uh, closer look at the um, fines for parents. Um, and when we actually make a report to the DMV. Um, the next section is the 6.24.050 and 6.24.060. Uh, maybe it's being the only uh, female on the council, but I do find it um, odd that the title of the section refers to female breasts, um, even though there are subsections that deal with um, like uh, male genitalia. And so I feel like the title should either strike both um, or should just be very broad and not refer to either gender uh, and maybe just say prohibition against display of private parts or, or however you wanna phrase it. But, um, but I do, it definitely caught my eye that it really focuses on uh, females. Um, the next section is uh, six point, um, Three, oh, actually, you know, I don't, that's not a, a change that I'm requesting, so I'll keep going. Um, the next section is page 44, 6.48.010. I did want to ask if the council has the ability 
um, to actually just say after a certain amount of false alarms, there's an automatic fee. No, like none of this, like going back and forth, and there's a um, there's all these um, requirements I think to get there. But can't we just say like we had with the car company that um, one of the car dealerships, you know, over I don't know twenty calls in a year, you're going to get charged a thousand bucks every time that there's another false alarm. Um, I think if we have the discretion to do that, we really should consider it. It was such a such a um, a big concern for the community, and I think that um, something like that may actually entice the um, the dealership to uh, pay more attention to those false alarms. Uh, hold um, on. Would it would it be easier? Because I see Mark's jotting and looking. Mark, did you want to take a couple of those maybe and and keep us on track? Because I know about false alarms. I just to be clarity too when you're answering the council member. Um, you know there are home alarms and stuff that there is a sequence of so many you can be charged and. That has been in process, but why don't you go ahead and then we'll go a couple more questions and come back. Sure, I'm, I'm very happy to do that. Um, so I think uh, just quickly going going back to the question in 6.14 about the uh, reporting to the DMV, I think uh, we could easily make a change to that. Uh, the, the section right now says shall report. We can change that to may report. Um, and then I think you've heard how the police will exercise their their discretion. So that's something where it might address your um, your comment on that, Council Member Mason. And then on the adult uh, businesses, I realized sort of what the uh, lack of clarity was in the actual title. Um, it, it's, there really should be a comma <laughs> um, in, in there, but I, I would agree with you that it would really mean the same thing if we just take out um, the, if we just leave in private parts, because that, that applies both to men and women. Um, so I think that's that's an easy change to uh, to make. And then lastly, on the false alarms. So the, the the problem that this ordinance is seeking to address is not the the sounding of a of an alarm. It's the response by the uh, police department to a false alarm. That's that's what it is. So um, with respect to to fees and charges, uh, you'll see coming forward in couple of weeks or maybe a month, the, the city's uh, fee study that does uh, have additional fees for uh, these sorts of false alarm responses. But it, it's not a fee because the alarm is sounding and somebody is, is uh, being affected by that nuisance. It's the, it's the fee for the police department responding. And can we, can we make that an automatic fee? Um, well, it, it, I, I believe, and I, I haven't fully fully read the, the fee study, but I was just scanning it earlier today. Maybe the police chief knows the answer to this offhand, uh, since it was from his department. I know there are fees for a variety of false alarms in that fee schedule for the first one, second one, and, and so on. I just don't remember the details of that. I thought there was for, you know, false alarm, you know, you have to go to a complex because the, the, the fire alarm goes off multiple times yeah. and that or a business and that becomes at some level then I thought it was in something in the master fee that that started to trigger that after X number of warnings and being being right. gracious yeah I mean normally you you know you don't want to necessarily have an automatic fee that the city is required to impose just when it happens um, you, you want to be able to have some discretion to figure out why it happened what's going on and, and so on but it, as I say there are there's a quite a robust system of fees in the master fee schedule. Okay. Council Member Mason, um, may I ask you to, to yield? I just saw our Council Member Salazar, did you have something on this topic or did you? I did. I had a follow up question on one of the one of the ones that was just addressed uh, okay. regarding the, um, the reporting to the DMV. And I'm just wondering, uh, it was my understanding that once the police issues a citation, it becomes a court issue, then it's up to the court to decide what the penalty and it's not really um, up to, I mean, I don't know if we, if we at that point have the ability to limit what the court would, would do or not do. The court. I don't, just to be clear, I'm not asking to limit what the court would do. It's that it's whether we report uh, whether we we report it to the DMV. 
But I, I don't even know that a failure to appear would be reported to the police department. Would we know that they didn't appear in court after being issued a citation? Because I know for a lot of things, once once the police department does their thing, they hand it over to the county to either do prosecution or, or in juvenile cases, it goes to the juvenile court. But I'm just wondering uh, do, do, how much authority we actually have over that. Police chief or city attorney? Maybe I'll defer to the police chief on, on that if he knows. And chief I could Mr. Hansen? Yes, Mr. Mayor that, that, and, and council member, that, that's accurate. Once this case goes over to the traffic court, it would be the uh, the judge that is making de a determination about the penalties and, and if and when to report to the DMV. Uh, we do not at the police department make any reports to the DMV to initiate suspension of licenses under other than under the admin per se law, which pertains to DUI arrests. So there, there's there's really no mechanism by which we would um, request the DMV to suspend a license. That would be done in the punitive phase through the court. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank, right, thank you, you council member. Go ahead, council member Mason. Yeah, I think so. With that said, I would go back and just ask to take that that out if if there's no if it's not even an um, option. So, um, I think the next um, here the next section I w just wanted to um, make a suggestion on is the 6.50, the safe and sane fireworks. Um, there are so I know that there's so many complaints about fireworks and I, I didn't realize until I read this section that uh, fireworks are allowed from June 28th to July 4th and so I, I would just suggest that um, they be July 3rd and 4th um, I don't know why we need to allow them so many days so maybe that's a, a compromise to a lot of the complaints that we have all gotten I think la definitely last year um, so that would be a suggested change is to allow them July 3rd and 4th. I don't really see a lot of people using safe and sane fireworks, to be honest, any other days anyway. Um, the, let's see, um, sorry, I've got a bunch of notes. Um, the next section is, oh, um, within that safe and sane uh, fireworks section as well. Instead of this um, section C, each violation of this chapter shall also be punishable by a civil fine in an amount set forth by the city council resolution. I wanted to ask if we have a resolution and also if it's also possible just to hand out a fine. So if a police goes to your house and you get a citation, you also get a bill that same night. Ask Chief Johansson if he can to to address that. So we, I, I guess, before he does, I'll say that um, the the enforcement mechanism here is an administrative fine, not a criminal mm -hmm. infraction or misdemeanor. Yeah, and I, and I have not gotten a citation. Thank thank you. Um, but I, I think my my question is more. I'm thinking of like if you know I've gotten tickets with my car parked, right? They hand you the ticket and you've got the $100 fine in, in the city. So do you, can we do something like that or is it already done? It, can you explain that process when someone's cited on 4th of July, please? And, and just before the, chair, the police chief is here is, you know, in, before it used to be where they brought them into the station, processed them, which obviously took a lot longer. So it was then became an administrative citation, which the council took the highest possible amount, which was $1,000. And we were limited. So someone says, why don't you make it 5,000? We can't just arbitrarily do that. But it also then in the field, they do write the citation, uh, hand them to them. And obviously then they'll, they'll get the bill as we call it. And then they have the right for an appeal. But it is a much uh, a more uh, streamlined process than used to be. And that's why you're seeing them having uh, more success over the years. Uh, Chief Johansson. Uh, actually, Mr. Mayor, you pretty much summed it up perfectly. Uh, I think your 4th of July ride-alongs have paid off. Um, yeah, we do. Actually, both are true. We issue an administrative citation, which actually serves as their bill as well. It includes the amount and how to remit payment and all the instructions. So it's really kind of a all-inclusive process. There is some follow-up that is done, I believe, through the clerk's office and finance as far as, you know, collection and possible additional notices if they're not uh, receiving payment promptly. And there is an appeal process and some other steps, but uh, the, the sort of um, shortcut version you're describing, 
Councilmember Mason is essentially what happens. The police officer is, is essentially handing them a bill, uh, in essence, at the point of the violation. Okay, per perfect. So then the only suggestion I have there is just to narrow the, the time frame. Um, can, can, can I, on that, because I just, I don't recall this, but uh, my memory says we used to have a longer duration of days. We shortened it. We also used to have uh, the hours, which we cut it off sooner as far as sales. Um, and I know the complaints, when you said all the complaints we get, and, and I'm not saying we didn't get complaints this year in other communities. I've spoken to many of the electeds. They were happening way before, like Memorial, uh, Memorial Day. They were happening before the booths even opened or were eligible, and that was the illegals, which are illegal. So I, I don't want to preface that if there's I, I don't know if you were talking about usage or sales, uh, but uh, I know complaints and that I was hearing were, were certainly way before the booths open. But C city attorney on the duration. Yeah, so I, I do have a memory of that as well. I'm afraid I don't have um, the, the voter initiative right up in front of me. And I don't know if anybody uh, remembers exactly what it says, uh, but the, the city council's ability to uh, further amend this is somewhat constrained by 6.50.080. Um, and so, you know, really before answering, I need to, to look at that initiative. I don't remember if there's a if there's a beginning date that's listed in that initiative. If anybody on the call happens to recall that, that, that would be great. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, oh, Vice Mayor Medina. Yeah. I, re I recall hearing from uh, our city attorney that we were limited and so we were able to reduce it a little bit and, and by reducing it much more than that, then we were infringing upon what the voters wanted to legalize fireworks in San Bruno. So we were careful to yeah, stay yeah. <laughs> in balance. I, I do remember saying that when the issue came up maybe a couple of years back. Um, if during the discussion I, I can go back and, and look at whenever that staff report was, I um, can pull that up. And I know it has the, the text of the ordinance is listed in it, but I'm afraid I don't recall what the year was that that, that was done. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm looking at just the um, use. I, I do understand the community's, um, you know, advocacy around the fundraising. I just know that in driving around, I don't see a lot of people using safe and sane fireworks on, you know, a week before. I really do feel like I, you see it really the 4th of July and maybe if it falls on a weekend, another day. But um, so I'm just saying maybe that's a, a nice um, a nice midway point for those who have dogs and are just very concerned uh, oftentimes around their pets. And then those who also are selling for fundraising is just to limit that to really the 4th of July, which is the holiday. Um, and then, um, okay, so we talked about the penalty. Then for um, the, this is just a gen, like general, and this is why I'm thinking that we, you might have to take it back, um, but the chapter 6.52, the tobacco retail, all, pretty much the whole section as it pertains to um, tobacco cigarette use, can we add e-cigarettes to that? Because e-cigarettes are now obviously um, all over. I mean, we had stores right here in downtown. Yeah, so in the following section, uh, tobacco is also defined as e-cigarettes. Oh, I mean, okay. It's in. It's it's actually defined as smoking or smoke. It's it's in the uh, N is in number of the definitions of the very next section, six point five six. Okay. Yeah, it, it's a little confusing because we we adopted that after, you know, the tobacco retailer permit sections were in the code well before. 6.56, but um, it were it, it refers to. Let me look back up at the front because at the very very front of the ordinance it has all the definitions, mm -hmm. and I think it refers to the one in 6.56. Let me take a quick look. Okay, and I can pull it back up again too. I can't find it offhand, but in any event, it, it's defined in 6.56. Okay, and I'm scrolling up. Okay, and then the, the last um, question was around the um, 
So around the chapter 6.59 and the commercial cannabis activities, I know you had asked staff, uh, you had asked um, council for direction in that area. I, I guess I'm trying to figure out, I saw that the zoning went to planning earlier this month and it's gonna be coming to council around zoning. And this title that includes commercial cannabis is before us tonight. So it doesn't, I guess it feels like staff is gonna be doing double work to make it a priority at another time when you're already doing the zoning, the zoning's about to be coming to the council um, and we're already looking at this title. So um, I guess I'm trying to understand better why we're, why not just as a practical matter, why we're not discussing it as the zoning comes to council and this title six is coming to council. Well, you know, it's a good question, council member Mason. I mean, really we've got the confluence of three things coming to council the two that you mentioned and plus the, the city council's sort of annual discussion of, of, of goals and priorities. I, I guess the bottom line is that whether it, whether it's, it's now at this moment or next month, probably doesn't make that much of a difference in terms of what we're doing. The effort will be coordinated irrespective of when it's done, um, both with respect to zoning and with respect to the, to the priorities. You know, if, if the city council were to tell us tonight, for example, uh, let's not do uh, Title VI or, or let's do all of it except for these and then come back uh, at, at the next possible meeting for, uh, for these two, we probably wouldn't be back to you for at least a month, if, if, not, if not a month and a half, because there's that much work that needs to occur um, in order to bring the, the cannabis item back to you. From the zoning standpoint, you know, Pamela may have some, some thoughts about it. Um, but uh, really there, the question is in what zoning districts is, are the, is the city going to allow these activities that are, that are currently not allowed? And I, I think by the time the zoning is, is approved, uh, you know, this, this effort may be completed as well. So I guess what I'm saying is kind of a long roundabout way of saying we need to, you're right that we need to coordinate those efforts, but I don't think it means doing anything first. I think it means they have to all be done together. So if, if zoning comes to council um, and the cannabis discussion hasn't been had yet, then is that going to be, that will have to be an amendment to the zoning that will have been brought to us maybe a couple months earlier? Is that right? Yeah, that, that, that's possible. Um, I actually haven't talked with, uh, with our director about that yet, uh, but that's something we can certainly discuss and make sure that it's, it's coordinated so that they're coming to you at either the same time or about the same time, or so that we don't have to go back and amend something else um, because of the, the lack of sequence. Okay. City manager. <coughs> Just want to confirm uh, what we're discussing is uh, potentially advancing uh, the uh, marijuana regulation so that they're sequenced when the other zoning amendments come uh, before the city council. Um, with that, what I would say is that there is a significant work effort to develop those regulations, given where we are now, and the fact that uh, the draft, well, we've had a consultant working for several months on our uh, zoning ordinance changes. They have already went to uh, the planning commission and will be before the city council in, I think, under 45 days. Um, there's really just not enough time to, to do the work. I mean, doing the marijuana regulations uh, is several months that involves uh, a, a, uh, at least three departments uh, uh, outside consultants. And uh, it just can't be done nor, nor, uh, in the amount of time that we're already coming back uh, with the zoning ordinance uh, that has already been through uh, the planning commission. And it would essentially be delaying that comprehensive update of our zoning for this new add-on uh, that uh, could be a several month uh, project. And so there's, what I would say is that there's nothing wrong with changing your zoning ordinance again. Um, it is a living, uh, breathing, breathing document. And um, should we decide to make any amendment, um, my recommendation would, would 
be that we move forward with the comprehensive amendments that we're already planning for. Uh, and we know that there are a number of development projects uh, and not, not just large, but also small projects that can't be done because our code is sometimes uh, inconsistent. Okay, I'd like to hear what some of the other council members think about, since that was a request of the of the city attorney, um, to determine how what we want to do with that um, with that particular section. Um, but otherwise, those are my comments. I, I don't know what the next steps would be, to be honest, because I don't know if it the next step is to take it back to make some of the changes, some of the suggested edits, and then bring it back again, or. Um, what the council if the council says no we don't want to take any of these suggestions but i do think especially around the juvenile truancy we we need to look at some options there around the penalties um and um and i think we should have a conversation i guess tonight around what we want to do for next steps with the commercial cannabis just because like i said we're looking at zoning uh, and this title right now so thank you okay um I'm uh, sorry Blair? city attorney Sorry, just just one comment nope. about about that. Um, the I think it, it's important for the council to know that the the vast majority of the zoning changes that are proposed are relating to housing, and are are not necessarily related and in, in to conform the zoning to the transit quarters plan. So they're they're not specifically relating to um, where we should have this this business or or that business necessarily. But they are related mostly to housing. Having said that, um, I agree with the city manager that it uh, we we would we would likely need to come back and amend the zoning ordinance after a a several month, if not longer, effort um, of, of sort of uninterrupted work on a cannabis in order to uh, to accomplish that. Yeah, I mean, ju just for myself, I think the zoning was something we put on strategic initiatives. It is critical. Uh, it has caused delays and other things, um, as for example, in the Mills Park. I mean, we, we had to adjust it because it, the zoning wasn't uh, current. Um, and so I would hate to see the zoning postponed or delayed uh, for any reason, because I think it's important and a lot of work and time and effort has been placed into that. Um, and I know um, I think it's not as quick as it sounds. I mean, the cannabis, I know we had a speaker that talked about uh, Berlin Games doing it. I didn't know what that meant, but I, I know it's not dispensaries. It is delivery service in a very specified area. So um, uh, I, I, I personally, I don't want to see the zoning uh, uh, stalled or, or upheld. I think it's a, a big thing off our check checklist. Uh, Vice Mayor Medina. Yes. Okay. Let me take down my hand real quick before I forget it. Um, yeah, Mr. Mayor, um, I do agree with you on that point that this zoning code update has been years uh, in need of being revised. So proceed with that. Um, I understand the cannabis is is a lengthy process. We were told that when we brought forward the uh, taxation of it and it would have been it would have been nice to be able to prioritize things a little sooner, but we do have a full plate. And when we get the opportunity as a council to prioritize um, the strategic initiatives and add new initiatives, that that would be one that we need to address at that time. Um, we have a, uh, staff has a roadmap of work ahead of them. And uh, I, I believe we should allow them to complete this, and we'll we will address cannabis at our uh, at our initiative meeting. Councilmember Hamilton. So uh, the vice mayor said most of what I was going to say. The um, uh, another reason to not delay on the zoning is um, you know one of the one of the, the complaints that we that we do hear from folks who come to come to San Bruno is how onerous our uh, our processes are and having the zoning be so complex as it is right now um, is absolutely contributes to that so I, I am also in favor of let's get the zoning through and then we'll go back and, and um, amend it as, as needed 
um, when we address when we address the cannabis. I absolutely want to get going on cannabis as soon as possible, but because it's so large, we have to also decide what we're going to not do um, in order to be able to do that, and then that, that's going to happen during the the um, the priority setting. One comment that I would make to, to to my colleagues here is, you know, scheduling that is uh, proving difficult, and we're we it's getting pushed pushed out. Um, I, for the last two rounds of those dates, moved things to make it work. Um, those those dates, and I encourage everybody to do the same because the the longer we push the priorities down the road, the longer everybody waits on um, on us making the changes that we need to make here. So I would just a, little, a personal little plea to my colleagues. Thank you. Okay. Um, anybody else, uh, Councilmember Mason? Do you have any other questions or um, on on the list? No, that's that was it. That was okay. uh, Thank you. All right, Mr. I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Vice Mayor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as for uh, Councilmember Mason's uh, concerns about the 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 curfew and the child and the the other things, um, perhaps staff could come back with with a recommendation and, and a little more thought on on how to maybe get um, to appease uh, Councilmember Mason. Well. I mean, as far as like the shall and the may, uh, I think that's that's an easy one. That, that's good enough. Okay. Yeah, I All think right. the city, right. yeah, the city attorney right. had made reference about the comma and you know, uh, being more universal, shall we yeah, say? Yeah. Yes. I'm trying to be delicate <laughs> to the topic. Um, and then I think what it came down to uh, was one about utilizing a tool that hasn't really been utilized, going back to 2014. So what I'd never like to do is take tools away. Um, especially, you know, because just like people say about drinking in the park, it's not allowed, but it gives that officer that tool if there's somebody that they spot or there's been a call to utilize and enforce that. So, and and again, the city attorney would have to clarify the other particulars, um, but because um, I'm so sorry, I was writing down and then, I, to be honest, I lost track a little. So, okay. city attorney, any thoughts? Uh, so, um, just a, just a couple of thoughts. I think. I think there's a couple of the um, suggestions that we can make without necessarily having to reintroduce the ordinance at a subsequent meeting. Let me just quickly go through those and then we can talk about the ones that remain. So uh, the first one uh, was a recommendation to uh, strike in 6.56.040, that section, it's in the smoking ordinance. That's the one that says it's not implemented until a later date and that date has already passed. So we, we can certainly make that change. Uh, with respect then back to a 6.14 with the truancy rate and the, the penalties, you know, we could certainly take a, a much more comprehensive look at that. Um, but I think the, the suggestion to, um, you know, change sh shall to may, you know, if that's enough for the city council, then we can certainly do that without reintroducing uh, that ordinance. 6.24.040 regarding private parts and, and gender, I think we can easily take care of that as well. Um, again, without having to reintroduce it, that's just changing the title, which doesn't really uh, change the ordinance at all. Um, and then I think really the, the remaining two issues that are um, more policy discussions for you are, are changing the date. And I've been looking while you've been talking to see if I can find the actual voter initiative. And I'm sorry, I can't locate it. If, if anybody can, maybe Melissa, um, or, or somebody uh, can locate that, we can take a look at it. I don't know if we can make that change or not. I'd have to bring bring it back in order to answer that question. And then the, the final one is, you know, what do we do about a cannabis? I think a couple of council members have indicated their thoughts about that. So I think of all the things that has, have been discussed, the only one that we really need to uh, take a careful look at is either the, the truancy one, um, and or the fireworks one. And uh, we, could we go forward and on the fireworks one make a modification if uh, the majority of the council felt to limit, and again, it's not the sale of, it's the actual dispensing of, meaning utilizing them. Um, can that be done then? And then the second one is on the truancy, which I think um, 
very quickly too. I mean, it's not been used in 214 and um, I, I'm not sure, um, you know what, I'm gonna pause because I saw the uh, city manager's hand go up. You're on mute. Hi, uh, uh, members of the city council and the public. Just wanted to opine on potentially changing the dates of fireworks and suggest that if council uh, would like to do that, we do not act on that tonight. Uh, I think the city council would uh, be benefited by a little bit more staff work on that, talking to the nonprofit agencies that utilize uh, revenue from fireworks. Uh, but then also uh, one thing uh, comes to mind, which is people that are essential workers or actually work um, uh, their ability to celebrate safe and sane with their families uh, and not technically break our ordinance. Uh, if they they utilize them uh, a few days before because they're they're they're, they're working um, uh, during the third and the fourth, and so I just think uh, if, if you're going down that policy uh, standpoint, um, you benefit from a little bit more analysis. I appreciate that, but city manager, I don't know that we need to talk to the 14 groups. I, I think it's a matter of is it allowed? Do we have that latitude anyway? If the answer is no. Point move. Uh, if the answer is yes, what are they? What are they? And then uh, I do. Uh, you bring up a very uh, good point that some people do work on the holiday, and you know. So do we deprive them of that? Uh, Council Member Hamilton. So um, I, I, I'm in a, I'm in agreement with that. Um, the and you know, the, uh, this of course now, now I'm, I'm wading into the uh, political third rail of fireworks in San Bruno, but the the um, the sale of safe and sane fireworks is and and the usage of safe and sane fireworks are not for the vast majority of cases are not the nuisances that people are reporting. It's the illegals and the illegals start months, weeks and weeks before the 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 legal sales of safe and sane fireworks begin and last for weeks after. So I don't necessarily think that that making this change is going to improve anything. Um, I, 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 with with that said, if 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 um, staff wants to do can do a little bit more study and bring us back some more useful information on it, that's fine. But I wouldn't want to hold up the the passage of of this section for that. Okay, thank you, Council Member. Um, uh, City Attorney, do, are you feeling you're getting enough guidance and that we would be able to go forward with the first reading? So I think it, I think the answer is yes, but I'm I'm not comfortable um, with a, you know, if we can adjust the dates of safe and sane fireworks, let's let's do that. I think that's a significant change to the ordinance, um, and if there is not a majority at the City Council that wants to direct us to do that, then absolutely we can go forward and I think introduce it as is. Uh, I can certainly look at the issue and, and uh, bring back some more information on it at a later date. Um, but I, given the controversy that, that every year um, everybody endures as a result of fireworks, I think Council Member Hamilton and the city manager's comments are, are correct in that the, changing the dates of, of sale of legal fireworks really isn't addressing the, the problem that some residents appear to be experiencing. And, and so I think that we'll, we'll do a lot of research and come to the same conclusion that we've told you before um, about, about fireworks. So I don't think there's really gonna be any change in, in what's in, in the problem. So I guess I would, I would recommend that, that, that the date not be changed for those reasons, but the city council could certainly direct us to look into it further if, if they wish. Yeah. Um, okay. Why don't we go around really quickly because that will determine if we go to the first reading. Um, I believe not at this point, not changing the dates. Uh, the staff is not prepared unless they had known about it ahead of time. So I just think, and, and I think Mark, you said it well, and I know you're not in San Bruno, but I know your city experienced it too because I talked to, to your mayor. Um, and um, I think it's the illegals. That is the problem we're having. And, um, you know, I don't get too many complaints about th those young people celebrating with the safe and sane. So um, anyway, um, I guess the question would be, do we want to proceed with not changing the dates in, in the firework, um, safe and sane fireworks, 
uh, usage dates um, at this time and proceed? Uh, yes or no? Mr. Hamilton? Uh, no, don't change it. Don't change the dates. Uh, Ms. Mason. Mrs. Mason, I'm sorry. Well, I thought, I thought we're looking, nobody knows right now whether the dates can be changed. So it's whether we're directing staff to look into it further, which I would support staff looking into it further. And I didn't propose, I think uh, City Attorney Zafrano said sale. I'm not proposing any change to the sale. I'm proposing a change to the use of the fireworks um, to narrow it down. And I would say yes, because we're, I don't know when the last time this title was reviewed. We're reviewing it now. So. The city attorney was saying we could go forward and still ask direct staff to check on that a caveat. Uh, council yeah. member, uh, I'm sorry? I'm certainly yeah, okay. happy to do that. I, I, I saw mean, your head go down, but you were saying No, no, yes. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> just, just for perspective, I, I think implicitly this, this chapter is reviewed every single year um, when over the 4th of July and everybody wrings their hands about what, what can we do about it. Um, so uh, I'll just say that it's, it's a... Um, Everybody knows what it says, I think. Okay. Uh, Council Member Salazar. And I know you said yes or no, but I, I'll, I'll stipulate that I, I'm 90% sure that the ballot measure did not include any dates, but I'm not comfortable with changing those dates as part of this process. And I, I, I actually think that we should solicit uh, input from the community before making a change like that. It's, it's become a uh, a tradition here in San Bruno to do those fireworks. And so if, if we do decide to make that policy change, I think that needs to be part of a, a, a different discussion. Uh, this process of, of cleaning up our municipal code has been kind of a routine thing where we're just looking for inconsistencies and making sure that we're lining up with uh, with state laws. And um, you know, this, this kind of seems like a bigger discussion to me. So I'm going to say uh, I would like to move forward without changing those dates. Vice Mayor. Um, Councilman Salazar brings up a good point. Um, if we said we were going to be changing the hours, there'd be a lot of people here uh, from our groups of people that uh, do the selling and do enjoy fireworks. So I, I believe we should move forward uh, with not changing the hours, the dates, and then staff could come back and reduce a review. And um, I, with memory, my memory serves me right. That's what we did when we reduced the hours of sale um, last time we did it. So uh, that's my point. I believe you're correct, uh, Vice Mayor. All right, um, I'm hearing uh, more than a consensus that to proceed forward at this time with it, the language as is. City Attorney, is there anything else that would prohibit us from moving forward? Uh, no, and I've indicated previously the minor changes that we would we would include um, that were discussed by the various council members, and we'll we'll have those in in the next if it's introduced. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, again, this is an action item. Uh, there is the first item, which would be if if w council wishes to waive the first reading. So moved. Uh, so for, uh, uh, motion by Salazar, second by Vice Mayor. I know you're on mute. Second sorry, by Vice sorry, Mr. Mayor. Did we no. get public comment? Um, thank you. You know what? Thank you, Vice Mayor. There's yeah. not many left, but is there anybody from the public uh, that wishes to speak? Please raise your hand. Thank you. I see no hands raised. Thank you. Confirmed. Um, okay, yeah, but thank you very much, Vice Mayor. Um, okay, so we had a motion on the floor from Salazar. Is there a second? I'll second it. Oh, I'm sorry. Vice Mayor, second it is on waiving the first reading. Uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Hamilton? Aye. Councilmember Mason? Um, I'm sorry, I, uh, I, have, a, I have a question. Um, it, it's gonna, because my vote kind of depend on, depends, depends on it. Is the truancy issue gonna come back? Oh, can, can we maybe just do the waiving of the first reading and then you can vote no on the ordinance if you wish? Um, well, they're they're linked, right? The waiving of the first reading, and I mean, no, reactions. No, I mean they're 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 they could come back again. They could come back to us again. Otherwise, so the, I, the waiving I mean, of the first reading is just so we don't. The waiving of the first reading is so we don't have to read the document in its entirety. The mm -hmm. ordinance, which then I would say on the question, why don't we then go to you to get clarity on the truancy? Okay, I'm okay with that. Yes. 
Okay. That's Continue. Where Marcellas are. Aye. Vice Mayor Marty Medina. Aye. Mayor Rico Medina. Aye. So before we get into uh, the ordinance, why don't we uh, have uh, Council Member uh, Mason? A little un, un, untraditional, but let's just do that since it's uh, 1030. I, I do, thank you, Mayor Medina. I just wanted to make sure so um, that the truancy, uh, it, it is going to come back. Like, is, is staff going to look into the penalty part? And then specifically that sentence, the city council determined that there is a high juvenile truancy rate in its schools. I feel like if we don't have a high tru truancy rate, it makes our schools look bad. It makes our students look bad. I mean, if that's not true, I want to take that out personally. Um, and I think it's worth it to determine whether that's true and to look at the penalties and, and what other cities have done since these truancy rules came out. Um, but I don't, I'm not sure if that has already, if that's what we're doing or if we're just saying the minor changes of the shall to may is being made tonight and nothing else is going to be looked at in this end tonight. Um, I'm going to go because we have another council member, but I think we all concurred on the shall. I'm sorry. It's the shall, shall to may. And I think that again, Staff doesn't have that information at this time, and again, we can direct them. If they had been prepared, maybe we could have hammered all this out tonight. But, Mr. Uh, Hamilton, council member, um, I would support taking out that the, the statement that our that our uh, schools have lots of truths. Um, it it doesn't add anything substantive substantive to the to the ord to the ordinances. That, so I, I I have no problem with taking that out. City attorney, does this change? Oh, I don't think so. Um, okay, I, just I as actually, long as wanted to yeah. check, we don't have to go backward. No, you don't. I did have a note to look into that, and I'll talk to the oh. police chief about it and report okay. back at, uh, when it's adopted. And if it turns out there really is a high rate, I'll tell you that there is and what the data is. And if it turns out there isn't, then we'll remove it. Well, I appreciate you already had a note to look into that and bring it further. So are we still okay, folks, uh, with introducing the ordinance as is? Obviously, there are two items that the city attorney and or staff will be looking into. Okay, let's uh, move on the ordinance, please. Action from Council. I'll make a motion that we introduce the ordinance of the City Council, the City of San Bruno, amending and readopting Title VI of the San Bruno Municipal Code and amending Section 1.04.020 um, with the provisions that were discussed. I'll second. Motion made, thank you. Uh, Hamilton Salazar, roll call, please. Council Member Hamilton? Aye. Council Member Mason? Aye. Councilmember Salazar? Aye. Vice Mayor Marty Medina? Aye. Mayor Rico Medina? Aye. Um, thank you, staff. Thank you all. Um, all right, let's move on to item number seven, comments from council members. And we're going to begin with Councilmember Hamilton, who is going to report out on the 2021 League of California Cities New Mayors and Councilmember Conference held in January of 2021. And then anything else you'd like to add after that for the evening, sir? Okay. Um, I'll keep it. I'll keep it brief because um, all of you have been to this training before. Um, it was uh, so. This was the um, the uh, annual um, uh, training and orientation for new mayors and new members of city council throughout California. Um, it was held uh, instead of in person in Sacramento. It was held uh, two full days and two half days um, on Zoom um, in January. Um, I found it very very valuable, as I'm sure each of you found it when you attended it. Um, the key learnings I took away, I mean, we spent a, a heck of a lot of time going back over the Brown Act yet again, um, but still every time we go over it again, I learned something new um, about, you know, serial, serial emails and serial meetings. There was a lot of discuss about, discussion about that and falling into those traps um, and a lot of talk about social media usage and the new, and the new um, laws that, that came up. Um, uh, thankfully, I, I have had a, uh, I had a leg up on that one because of the um, presentations that we got from our city attorney. Um, we also learned um, a lot about how to advocate for San Bruno with uh, the regional and state entities that we're, that we're members of. So that was, um, that was a, a big takeaway. Um, the finance session was very intense and very overwhelming. I'll be referring back to those materials often. I am absolutely not an expert on finance after that because it was a fire hose of information. Um, very, very uh, complicated. Um, but it was nice to know that after that was over, the comments from everybody else was, were the echoing mine, so I didn't feel left out. 
Um, the only real negative was that there was very limited um, opportunities to network, and um, you know I'm sure like each of you were able to to um, you know network and find folks um, in, in with similar similar sized cities across the state to um, to connect with, and they tried their best to do that, but it's it's Zoom, so there's only so much you can do, and it is what it is. So. Um, so that, that is my report. I'm happy to take any questions. If anybody has any, I doubt they would. Um, so that's it. And then um, the only other comment that I had um, is regarding uh, you know we, we've gotten we've gotten underway with the um, the clean clean San Bruno uh, subcommittee, um, and but I will defer to the, our, our vice mayor to report out on that. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Mason, any comments? Um, I would just say that in driving around the city, it feels like um, people forgot that COVID is here. And so just a reminder to everybody that people are still dying and are, you know, people are still in the hospital. Um, I, you know, know somebody whose wife is still in intensive care right now. Um, and so just a reminder, wear your masks. And if you're going to go out and eat, you know, just still stick within your bubble because once you take off your mask, you can still get other people sick. So that that's about it. Just a reminder that we are still in a shelter in place order. The, the state has not lifted this, the shelter in place order. And we really should all still be following the mask ordinance and the social distancing and washing of hands. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Vice Mayor Marty Medina. Yes, sir. Uh Okay, so I just basically wanted to say that uh, the Clean San Bruno Action Committee is is uh, been active. Um, we are going to have a Zoom meeting on this Saturday, so people keep your eyes peeled for social media posts, and we'll be sharing with staff the Zoom um, Zoom, Zoom meeting information for this Saturday, February thirteenth. 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. We're going to stick to one-hour meetings. Um, anything more than an hour, people are ready to get out. And um, I would encourage our residents that you don't have to wait for an organized cleanup. Uh, there, there are members of our community that are doing that now, taking care of their street or taking care of a street that they pass by that they're just tired of looking at with litter around it. Um, and I, I want to echo what, what uh, Councilmember Mason said. You know, COVID is still here. I, I, my sister's co-worker, their whole family got it. And one of their members isn't going to make it. It's been in ICU for a month. And it's just devastating. So um, just be safe. We've got this far. And we just need to go a few months longer, hopefully. And uh, just be safe. So... Thank you. Thank you, sir. Council Member Salazar. Um, I'll, I'll echo what, uh, what Linda and Marty said. You know, I, I know we're all frustrated with, with sheltering in place and not being able to do things we're used to do. We're all looking forward to being done with this, but just little things, you know, just wearing the mask, social distancing, they're, they're small sacrifices. Um, and they'll keep us all safe, uh, not not just ourselves, but those around us. Um, and, uh, so let's just hang in there. Um, we can do it. We're uh, we're definitely seeing some light at the end of the tunnel. So let, let's all hang in there. Thank you. Um, for me, a couple things. First, I just a FYI to council, I have reached out and uh, through the principal of Cappuccino and he has reached out to the uh, faculty advisor to the uh, CAP Environmental Club and I've offered to uh, zoom in and speak with them at their next upcoming meeting. So that is in the works as of tonight, uh, just to kind of do that and maybe I have a little soft spot for CAP for some reason. Um, also, um, I wanted to um, adjourn tonight and just, and, and um, you know, it's been tough times and it's also important and, and that we have individuals that uh, we have lost, uh, but it's come to my attention that there are, are two folks. You have uh, Luis uh, Ducci, who is a 60 year resident as well as a county resident, of course, of San Mateo, which was Angelo uh, Adiego's mother. 
And if you remember her, she was principal at uh, uh, Parkside, uh, Bel Air, she worked at St. Robert's. So I'd like to, for us to adjourn in her memory. In addition, I would also like um, to uh, uh, Marilyn Rosekind. Marilyn Rosekind also uh, lived in San Bruno. And if you might remember, her son is Mark Rosekind, who was the NTSB uh, gentleman uh, that actually uh, worked on the San Bruno pipeline explosion. Uh, he graduated from Crestmore. So these are folks that have uh, roots in our community and want to acknowledge them for that. I also want to then, on a third note, take this opportunity since we're talking about um, folks and uh, folks that have been in our community and as well as uh, Mark and Angela's uh, mother, but is also to take a moment for those that have lost uh, a loved one, or let's say specifically in this case, uh, their mother this year or last year, that uh, we also uh, take a moment for them as well. So for all three of those, I will ask that we take just a moment and we will adjourn in all their memories. Thank you, Council, very much. Thank you, staff, very much. We're going to have an adjournment to the next regular City Council meeting, which will be held on February 23rd, 2021 at 7 p.m. As uh, was already indicated, please stay strong, stay safe, and we'll see you then. Enjoy.